All right. So as we're all here, I'm sitting here and I've come to something of a revelation, you know, sort of gazing at my navel and uh, just finding things about finding things about myself and about the world. And uh, the understanding that I have from my life and from all that I'm about, all that I know, is that I am going to remain a sexless wonder for my entire life. And uh, I discovered this because the eclipse happened recently, you see. And the world got a little bit darker. And I looked at the world around me, and the very first thought that popped into my head was, damn, the world's frame rate just went down a little bit. <laughs> and that's when I knew, not a shot, ever, for the rest of my life. That's that... <laughs> Now fix my audio settings. Someone's complaining about it already. Oh, but it's. <laughs> Wait, never mind. Okay, talk about never mind. Brightness issues. Oh, so that's echoing. That's not. That's not a thing on my end. I I just control oh. the volume settings. Well, you should have told me that beforehand. I I'm not hearing an echo. Okay, well then we're oh, fine. No, no, I couldn't have had two streams. Okay, one right. guy. Never mind. Okay. Okay, that's what happens. Right, before we start properly, actually, guys, uh, does the audio sound level? I know our viewers are nice and don't point out our mistakes, but like, we no, want please. to know if things sound as they should. Please be mean. Have please be cruel. It's it's appreciated right now. For those of you listening in post on the spoofy, well, uh, okay, this is a fun segment for you, isn't it? Uh, just just keep laughing. You can't hear it. Quieter than peer. That makes sense. Let's fix that. Thank testing, you. testing. One, two, three. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Anyway, welcome everyone to Design Dorks Gaiden, the show where you can feel a little bit better about yourself and your chances in the world if you care to have them. <laughs> I am Pierre Kong, and I am the Duke of Dorks. All right. I hope everyone is nice, hope everyone is cozy, hope everyone had a nice time with the coming months and whatnot. Yeah, this has been a strange month. Like, very much a, like, transitionary period for both of our channels. Yeah, Just we both like, became streamers. Um, I don't know, I'll, I'll see about getting my VTuber rig set up soon, but we'll see. We'll get there. <laughs> it's gonna be based off of the the... The pink suit and the tie artwork that you sent me for the Akechi video. Uh huh. Yes. Oh, I'm I'm excited. That was that was a lie. It's probably going to be like oh. a friggin' banana fairy from Donkey Kong sixty four or something. I don't know. I, 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 that, that's still good. That's still good. I don't know. Uh, you tell me, everyone, chat. If I were a VTuber, what would I look like? Make fan art. Uh hmm. That is. You can't draw. You don't count. I how first off, am I, I wrong? No, but <laughs> I, I I can I can do a little bit of animation. You have I... skill, honey. You have skills elsewhere. It's fine. Okay, okay, fine. We okay, both so... admitted yeah. something deep about yourselves. You can't draw. I can never have a meaningful relationship. That's how it works. <laughs> okay. You want to and get speaking of never having a meaningful relationship, let's talk about video games. <laughs> Perfect. What you been playing? Um, so there are important updates uh, to the world that have to be given because uh, this is everyone's annual check-in for how's Pierre doing at Mario Party this month. Is it still good? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, I want everyone to understand that I had the most Looney Tunes game of Mario Party 3 in my life. It was absurd. Um, no, that's Mario Party 5. Mario Party 3 is a different Looney Tunes that I had. So, here I am. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the board Waluigi's Island. Hey, yeah. It's a big board familiar with Waluigi. The issue with this board that I've had every time in my life is that the only way to get to Boo is to go by a 50-50 junction, and there is a random chance that it will send you straight to start. 
and there's, there's a random chance that nothing happens, you get to go to Boo. Mm. I went to that junction four times in that game of 20 turns. The first time, it's an up or down choice. I went down, and I fell in the hole. The second time, I went down and fell in the hole. In this time, every other player has gone to that junction at some point and gone up. And they do not fall in the hole. There are a total of eight crosses going up that are all successful. That go to Boo and steal, usually from me. <laughs> I'm doing you cut out there for a second. You say that one more time. Because I I know how to play the game. I know what I'm doing. I know the targets on my back. I'm just a little guy in the world doing my best, oh, and yeah. I'm sucking at vi at mini games for the first half of this. I get there. Third time, I go down, and I fall in the hole, <laughs> and then I go up, and I use a mushroom on the second to last turn. And the way that the spaces were laid out, I was just looking for a good place to land. I was looking, okay, I can probably guarantee happening star with one more happening. I can probably, I may be able to land on the bank based on uh, going back and forth. But there is Bowser directly in front of Boo at the top of that junction. Oh, please. And I have zero coins. On the second to last turn, Bowser will give me 50 coins if I land on him with zero coins, giving me a guaranteed star steal the next turn. All I have to do is go to the junction and hit up. Because for 14 straight passes... Up has been the correct answer. So I go to the junction. And I hit up. And there's some lag. On my end. Because it's over net play. And I don't see myself fall in the hole. The next thing I see I'm back at start. <laughs> there is just a jump scare of speed up. And I go. Ah! <laughs> so I want you all. To understand uh, the amount that I had to go through to still win that game. No shot. Bullshit. No, you didn't. I absolutely did. I won it by getting the mini game star by five coins and getting happening star. Well, yeah, because you keep falling them down. And because I did my thing where I act like I've been bullied because I've been bullied. And I'm like, you wouldn't do that for me. And I talk. And I keep talking. And then I stop talking. And people are like, Pierre, do you want to talk? I went, okay, so here's what I think. And they listen to me for some reason. Oh, They're that's... wonderful people. I shouldn't be doing this to them. No, you shouldn't. That is... God, the amount of bullshit wins I've seen you pull off... They're not bullshit wins. They're calculated. No, I, that's what I mean, though. <laughs> You've been there. You've fallen for it. I know. <laughs> you see Ugh. that I'm right. The issue is that I'm good and also right. Manipulation, exactly. Just constant... <laughs> Deception checks with advantage. Mm-hmm. No, me and my boys are going to mess you up. I am aware. I still feel, I still have the scars. <laughs> uh, anyway, I also played Mario Party 5. Uh, that was the finale to our Mario Party League 2v2s. Uh, I will not spoil the results of that, but you saw some of that game. Tell me what you thought of the game. That was so much fun. Also, wasn't it 7? It no, it was five. It was uh, Bowser's Nightmare. Why does... Why does Pierre have... <laughs> I'm pulling up footage. 
No, yeah, that, that, that's five. He just has it right, marked down to seven. This is a call-out post for Pierre, who does not understand which Mario Party game he is playing. What do you moment. mean I have it? I Right here, I have Mario Party 3 and 5 on the in the chat. No, no, he no, but he's got. I, I'm I'm pulling up the background footage and he has it marked as seven, which is why I thought it was. God, I don't know my Mario Party games very well. That's yeah. Starfold's channel. What are you talking about? Am I? Are we thinking of two separate things? This is the this is the two versus two. Yeah, that's on Tarvold's channel. Yeah, it's the it's the game you seven. Called... Mar F finale. Yeah, it's but you said Pierre doesn't know his Mario parties. Don't call me out when someone else is making a mistake. That's for Mario I Party. Tar God, I, I'm tired. <laughs> You're tired every podcast. Well, it's, it's, it's almost like I have so many things I'm constantly doing all the time. But yes, yes. Watch the whole thing. Delightful game. Don't want to spoil either. But the constant conflict between Team Flesh and the Corporation has been in one of the best Mario Party like YouTube series I've ever seen. Yes, I know it's Mario Party 5, but look at the t I will scroll down to the title. Bowser's Nightmare Finale MP7 Mario Party 7. I'm not crazy, right? Does he That's the file format. It's uh, MP7. It's so oh, advanced. Fucking... Oh. <laughs> it's just it's just numbered by the which episode it is. I'm an, I'm an yeah. idiot. Yes, it's the 7th episode of the I'm going to go back and delete this segment of the VOD. Okay, sounds great. Um, so, moving on, uh, just a bunch of short games that I played. Um, starting with Popeye 2. Did you know that a game called Popeye 2 exists? I didn't, but I think I could have assumed. It is a Japanese exclusive Game Boy sequel to Popeye 1. It is a 2D platformer starring Popeye, and it is bad. No. The sad part is... It is probably the best Popeye game. I, I, I can imagine, because I don't think I have ever heard the phrase Popeye game in any context. You ever. haven't had the GBA classic Popeye Rush for Spinach? Strangely, no. Which is a weird four-player on-foot platforming racing game? Okay. Uh-huh, it's not good. Anyway, uh, the feature of Popeye 2 is that he ha has his fist out, and he can fist in the air. And every time that you get a can of spinach, his fist gets slightly larger until it's the size of his body. Mm -hmm. uh, that That's it. It just increases the hitbox, and he's just standing there with the fist the size of his body. <laughs> when you get maximum fist, he then shoots cans of spinach out of his fist. As, as he does. It is a projectile. Yeah, that, that um, the hitboxes don't work. The game is not very good. I thought that it had tech where you could fist in the air to give you a boost of momentum, but it turns out that no, you just hold the button to run. I was making mechanics where they didn't exist. What is this? God, I'm, I'm looking at the sprite. It's a, it looks like he's got like a Santa's like knapsack slung over his shoulder, but no, that's just his No, hand. no, it's just his fist. God, that's, ugh. You forgot the Switch Popeye game? No, I didn't. I've played that as well. Anyway, um, as a Popeye lover, I can safely say that if you want an easy speedrun win, y'all should invest in Popeye 2 speedrun strats. Because ain't nobody playing this fucking game. All right. Anything else, or is it just N no? Better I just want people to know adventure. that I played a bad game. Alphabet book, we'll get into a deeper bad game later. Okay. Um, but speaking of games that are not bad, I played a game called Boomerang X. Do you have any familiarity? Boomerang X. I don't think I have ever heard of this. Awesome. Looking at it, so I have this... never heard of this. Yep. This is essentially a tech demo premise of a game. You have a boomerang and are in first person, and that's basically it. But every time, and they ask you, clear a field of enemies, and you do that. And once you do that, you unlock a new ability with your boomerang. One ability is 
you instantly recall it back to your hand. So it's just a rapid fire there, there. Okay. The next ability you unlock is you teleport to your boomerang's current position. Ooh. You can do this infinitely in the air. So you can infinite air jump while dodging enemies constantly. Your next ability is that you can slow down time while you are midair with a boomerang. Oh, this, this sounds fun. This is like a two and a half hour game. If, you, but it has the good movement. If you are into good movement in a video game and are like, I just want a simple premise, please. That feels really good. This is that. This game is called Boomerang X. Yeah, I'm kind of skipping forward in gameplay just to see what this is at, like, higher levels. Yeah, 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 oh, no, 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 go is, for it. this is just fluid. Isn't it? Oh, that looks so nice. I believe it's on Switch as well, so... Yeah, it, Even it our audience can see it. Right! Not the best frame rate at times, but yeah, it, it's there. It's no, there. no, 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 it's, it's, you know, it's a game. It's clearly a concept game, but it's one of those I'm like, I don't have more to say. No, yeah, it's Here. Just, it just looks sick. I present to you game. Will you accept game? Please accept game. Yeah, if you want, if you want a good speedrun game that'll actually make you feel like a god playing it, this seems like, oh, just the geometry on that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. No, I no, I thought I thought this one would get you. Yeah, I consider myself intrigued. Yeah. Precisely. Also, very soft spot for like fully bandaged, just protect. Yeah. No. 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 It's, that, it's, it's a good art style. Yeah. No, it plays with it well. Nice. Yeah. Uh, speaking of aesthetics, though, um, I finished a little game called Undertale. Oh, you did! I, I saw did. that stream. You did! Um, there's not much to say, except there is video evidence. I did it. I have killed a man. Yeah, the uh, four-hour, 40-minute stream until it's done. Uh, yeah, but uh, we stopped playing that at, like, two hours in. I just want to say it only took me three hours total. Very if you nice. combine everything, three, three and a half hours. That's all we need. Balls in your court, other streamers who took longer. <laughs> uh, but no, no, no. I, I want to say that Undertale's greatest mechanical triumph is that the part of the game that feels the best to play is so antithetical to its message but proves it perfectly mm -hmm. that real gaming is locked behind doing the cruelest shit to both yourself and the people around you. And I just think that's cool. Oh, yeah. I, like, we're so far removed from the Sands fight being a thing that we can't take a step back and go, no, wait, this is good and memed for a reason. It works on a lot of levels. Yeah, like, I, I know that just, just watching me is a terrible drum, but I, I, I know that there's so much just slime in Undertale discourse, mm -hmm. but, like, the core of it's so fucking good, man. Mm -hmm. How do you feel now that you've beaten Sands in your 30s? Uh, I'm really strong. I'm really powerful. Um, I, I'm now the true gamer. Nice. And that that's what matters. That's what truly matters. And then chat told me, sit around for 15 minutes and something will happen. And then I did that. And then we played a little bit of Pacifist and all of chat left. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, no, you've all seen this, haven't you? Mm. But you don't love my papyrus voice? Also communicates the message perfectly. People aren't interested unless there's cruelty and violence. Exactly. It's fabulous. Which we'll get to later it's... on one of your later games as well. 
there's a reason for that. <laughs> I don't believe in that. But yeah, I, I said most of my piece on Undertale last month, I just wanted to express that. Um, so then, I know I've been going rapid fire through these past few games, but the next three, I think, have a little bit more meat on the bone. I just want to sort of introduce cool concepts to people. Uh, right. The next game that I talked about, I did it as like a little reward for uh, beating Sands, because I just wanted to show people something, mm. was Petal Crash. Uh, like, like the flower petal or a bike petal? Yeah, Petal. P-E-T-A-L. Crash. Like the Bandicoot. And this is just a charming Game Boy Color style puzzle game made by a very small indie team uh, written by a uh, webcomic artist. And I just really like it. Like, I, I've sat here and I've talked about a lot of versus puzzle games on this podcast before. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the issues with versus puzzle games, which is usually... In order to make it competitive, a lot of versus puzzle games make you stop being able to play the game. Uh, it's the reason why I hold Tetris Attack in such high acclaim, is because you are always schmoovin'. You are always looking for the next move to make. You are not inhibited by five extra steps when the opponent rains garbage on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can still do your thing. Your time limit is just that much shorter. Or you have to perform in this small window. Oh, this I'm, I'm looking at gameplay right now. This it's it's like a Zelda block puzzle kind of deal, where if you make yes. matches, it launches the blocks. It la yes. So what oh, happens is that when you make a match, it launches the blocks in whatever direction the momentum carries it, and it like shoots out a little wave to the sides of it. So you have to sort of make little matches of two all throughout a grid. Meanwhile, there are little timers that every time that you do a move, uh, new blocks will spawn in. And some of them will be helpful blocks, but if your opponent is schmoovin', some of them will be garbage blocks that impede your progress. That can only be cleared if you do a clear adjacent to them. Uh, but the issue, but the smart thing about it is you have time to prepare for it. It's all based on your combined reaction times. So if you happen to be slow, then. You can still plan out your moves. You still know exactly when the garbage is going to come down. But the game's scoring system is based on the amount of combos you've done versus your opponent's amount of combos. So it's like a first to 20 kind of system. And then okay. if you do a two match, that deducts two from their lead. And the longer a round goes, the shorter that distance becomes to the point of like lead by five will cause you to win. And they'll shoot back out to 20. So things get more and more intense as the game goes on inherently. And that's like a first to three system. And it, But it keeps your garbage in the play area. So it's very join back fight, killer instinct, where your momentum carries over from round to round. Okay, okay, I'm following. This looks rad as hell, man. Yeah, um, it's a small game, only local. But it's really good. The reason I know about it is because the Baz is in it. And oh, really? I don't know if you know, but my career is partially based on that character. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. How, how yeah. did that get so many views? I. Uh, you want to know the secret? What is I the released secret? it. And then eight hours later, the Super Best Friends broke up. Oh, oh. <laughs> I learned that they broke up from comments on that video saying I needed this after the news. And I kind of sat there with my head in my hands going, this is the first video of mine that has ever broken 2,000 views. No! <laughs> well... One YouTuber's problems is another one's content. They were in you. the middle of a Kingdom Hearts Let's Play. There was no <laughs> sign. Oh, I that's... went to bed, and I was hopeful. And then Wooly retweeted us that said, You have chronicled a storm. Thank you. 
and then hours later posted Super Best Friends Final. Oh, that's rough, buddy, indeed. Oh. But such a story, though. Such a story. Isn't it? I I am the luckiest boy. Uh, anyway, the, the reason that I played Pell Crash in specific on stream is because they actually just finished a very successful crowdfunding campaign for Pedal Crash 2. Mm -hmm. And that will be coming out in, like, the next year or so. So I want everyone to really look forward to it. It's going to have rollback netcode, so it's a real fighting game. Nice. It's going to be bigger. It's going to have a story mode and an adventure mode. And the writing in this game was already good. It was already smart and reflective and introspective, but cute. Love games like that. Like, like please understand that in spite of this being a mostly a cute little puzzle game, the writing is really good. In like that really charming webcomic kind of way. Oh, lovely. That's a five and a half. I like that. Like you have the character Orchid, whose flower is an orchid. And she's like, yeah, guess what? You pick the best route first try or maybe other tries. I don't know. I can't see your other playthroughs anyway. Sup. Uh, anyway, I found this flower. We're going to go around to people and we're going to be chill. And then through the story, she loses her chill and she loses her self-awareness. And she goes, I don't know. I'm just detached and don't know what I want in life. OK. All right. I'm like, damn, Orchid, you funny and sad. You're like Earthbound. Sick. <laughs> and the soundtrack's really good. Lovely. Yeah, I just wanted to recommend that. Um, next game. Went to my childhood and dug up Pokemon Pinball. Did you ever play Pokemon Pinball? Nope. But I Shit. understand the premise. Pokemon Pinball is the only pinball game I've ever loved. Which is to say, I am so intensely bad at pinball that I cannot enjoy pinball games. I understand the idea of it. I have no desire to learn the physics of it. No, yeah, I, I feel you. Same I am, the same boat. I'm never a strong physics person. Pinball is like the nadir of physics games. Pokemon Pinball was my first Pokemon game. Really? Yes. So I need you to understand that my discovery of tons of Pokemon was randomly sitting around and seeing them pop up as sprites for the first time in a randomized pinball set. I kind of love that. Let me tell you, the first time I saw Scyther, yeah! my mind was blown. And you have to catch them to get their Pokedex entries. You just get their silhouette of what they vaguely look like if you don't catch them. It's just bladed mantis wings and art. That's so cool. Yes. That was my introduction to a ton of Pokemon, and the sprite work in this game is fabulous for them. Because it's... Honestly, probably their best sprites up until the GBA. Oh, yeah. Oh, def definitely up to the GBA. Mm -hmm. It's it's such a cute game. It's got a lot of good music, a lot of good remixes of Pokemon themes and whatnot. Uh, there are two tables, red and blue, and my Pokemon Red Loving Heart has to admit that the red table fucking sucks. What's the major difference? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not clear. Uh, okay, so the so the blue table has two uh, side stages, a um, a cloister and a slowbro with its mouth open mm -hmm. that this cloister has detached from. Um, if you go into the, I believe the slowbro's mouth, you will go into a Pokemon catching phase. If you go into the cloister's mouth, you will go into a Pokemon evolving phase. 
This is all at the center and it's controlled by a magical gravity well that shoots your ball into one or the other. Okay. The red table has a ditto in the top left-hand corner that you have to perfectly shoot the ball all the way up the left-hand side to get to to evolve. Ah. And a bell sprout who is at two o'clock which means that shooting toward the right side of the table is always bad. And also, there is no help. It is just hit this specific ramp every single time if you want to make progress. Oh, yeah, that, does, that doesn't sound like a good pinball board. I'm with you. No, but it's, a, but it's a real pinball board as opposed to the magical gravity well that helps you catch Pokemon. Well, yes, but the gravity well sounds fun, though. Yes, it is fun, because sometimes the gravity well freaks out and just shoots the ball. <laughs> They're like, ooh, it just goes swirly-whirly. But yeah, every time you catch three Pokemon, you go to a bonus stage. Each table has two different bonus stages, and then if you survive and somehow catch nine Pokemon, you fight Mewtwo in a pinball battle. As one does, yeah. He's really hard. I used safe states because he's hard. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm bad at pinball, but I did it. I beat Mewtwo. Um, yeah, I got a good rally going. Um, this is the most fun I've ever had with pinball. Because there's just an incentive to get a little bit better every time. Very nice. Argue train card game GB. Oh, yeah, train card game GB. No, you're right. But but Pokemon card artists are insane. They're like the most talented artists in the world. This is true. That picture of Cubone sat on the hill is the most beautiful piece of art anyone has ever made. How much of your love of Pokemon, like, fraction-wise, is based off of that one Cubone picture? Like 5%. Okay, nice. Yeah, I, th I think solidly. I think solidly trading card game art is like 5%. Uh, it also has to do that Cubone's at first attack is Snivel, where it cries so hard that you do 20 less damage to it. Out of pity. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, oh, shit. Cubone, you a real one. <laughs> Me saying that at it's like age five. Cubone, you a real one. Yeah, that was definitely the slang of the time. Yeah. All right, and then I have one other small game before I ramble on forever about singular games, and that is Pizza Tower. Because a little thing came out called the Noise Update, and that added a whole second character. It, oh, that's what this is. Somebody added the noise to my XCOM streams, and I thought this was like a... Like an OC variant. Of it, which you is didn't so cool. know what the noise I was? I had no idea. Okay. Important That's context. That's very funny. Because I saw parts of that stream and you're like, let's bring the noise. I'm like, I thought he know. I thought he knew. No, I just thought, okay. I'm like, you you, you gave him a giant yeah, hat you, and you, everything. You, you have to understand that there was also in those same streams a Luigi that was part of the Pizza Tower universe. So I thought this was just a thing that was happening. Just people throwing Did people just own... have the PTU? Yeah! I mean, yeah, kinda. Uh, anyway, uh, Pizza Tower was a good game, and after the noise update, it is still a good game. Uh, basically, it lets you do a new game plus mode as the noise, and he is... much less intuitive than Pepino, yet somehow... better? Okay. Because you, you can just fly, so... You know, the major thing of uh, Pizza Tower is that Pepino can run up walls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he goes really, really fast. The noise doesn't do that because he's cool. He has a skateboard. So instead, he does a sick trick off of the wall. And that bounces his momentum off of the wall. However, you can bounce off in any direction. And you can also do a skateboard ground pound which you can then cancel into another sick trick. Thus, if you continue doing sick tricks and skateboard pounds repeatedly, you can fly. This this is the Tony Hawk sequel we've all been waiting for. This looks so yes. cool. 
You can also ground pound and turn into a little Tasmanian devil tornado. <laughs> and that will automatically break all blocks beneath you and will kill enemies, but doesn't have any invincibility. God, I'm just watching footage of this. Why, why is there a pizza pope? He's just there. Okay, sure. He's there to cure your ailments, like, you know, if you're dead. Or have Mort the Chicken. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, speaking of Mort the Chicken, uh, they changed every single interaction the noise has with a specific level power-up. So, for example, when Pepino has Mort the Chicken, who is Mort the Chicken, uh, he will use him as a club, and they will be in tandem as a weird little freaky duo, where mm. Mort will basically be a small grapple to latch off of ledges. When the noise has him, he grabs him by the neck and throws him like a boomerang. And he will boomerang X to the chicken. Okay. Pepino cannot stop his momentum in a barrel. The noise can stop it at any time and just jump around. But he also doesn't ricochet off of walls while in a barrel. So you have to manually control all sorts of manual switches, making it you're much more in control. But doing the basic level patterns is much harder. Fascinating. Okay. Gosh, this, um, when you're, this looks so when you're a fun. ghost, yeah. When you're a ghost, he needs to power up by killing other ghosts before he can do ghost things. Whereas Pepino is just like, ooh, ghost dash. Mm -hmm. But his maximum ghost dash is so much better. What is the noise? The noise is a parody of Domino's pizza mascot, The Noid. From their famous uh, slogan, Avoid the Noid, wherein the Noid hated Domino's Pizza a whole lot. Huh. He's, like, he's like the anti-Tricks rabbit and would try to destroy Domino's Pizza. But he would always fail because Domino's is just too good at their job and too speedy at delivery. This was discontinued because a man named Harold Noid thought that he was being harassed by the campaign. It was, it was between this as a parody or Hatsune Miku, and I think they made a good choice. Oh, okay, but can we get both though? Because that also sounds really, really funny. No, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's really, really funny. Um, the fake Pepino boss fight is changed. We're in, you know, the chase sequence at the end of that boss fight. Yes. Um, originally, it had rubber banding where uh, the it would get closer and closer and faster and faster if you were too good. The noise reintroduces that, and he is too fast for you to avoid. But when you reach the noise, the noise screams at fake Pepino, and he gets scared and backs off. <laughs> and just lets you finish the level quietly. <laughs> There is just a little bit of polish everywhere on this. I don't know if there's enough for me to make a full video because everything that I would say would just be like a retread of my thoughts on Spampton. Mm -hmm. Of like, yeah, no, look, it's desperation. Look, guys, we did it. I mean, it was a like, I need to video. More, I, I need to more fully develop my thoughts without just sitting here repeating myself. But yeah, um... That game that you thought was good, guess what? It's still good, and now it's a little better. Huzzah. It's always great when updates like that are just like, oh yeah, this is just... How'd you get higher than 100? That's impressive. Yeah. Lovely. Still not in my top 100. Seriously? But it's a good game. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no, no. It's like 108 or so. Okay. It's, it's really good. It's just, they're, they're little nitpicks for me. That's fine. That's fair. It's like as close as you can be without actually making it. No, I feel that. All right. And uh, that's me talking for a while. I have six, but technically four other games to talk about. But you can talk about games. I will talk about games for a bit. Can do, can do. Okay. So... This is midterm season and final season for me, so I have not gotten around to uh, that much stuff currently. But I do have my traditional, like, let's get through the regular stuff first. 
Oh, yeah, uh, no, you, I have Mario Party and you have whatever else. Yep, 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 yep. So, why is this so hard to find footage for? I'm just going to grab a random one. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, last month, I talked about a Cool Age of Empires expansion that came out. This month, a Cool Age of Empires expansion came out. And... It's okay. Oh! Oh, okay. Th th this is a absolutely bizarre... This is the one that was the, um... Leveling up a mod maker to make official content for the game. It's the the, uh, the Sonic Mania kind of parallel here. <laughs> right. Uh, that... It's so bizarre, because you've played RTS, like, custom campaigns, right? They get... Yes. They get weird, and this is somebody who's been making them for 12 years. So when bringing all of them up to uh, be in the same official format... You can go from game to game to game, and you'll and you'll just oh, this is the time period of Japan, so it makes sense that actually your your, your spearmen should be the basic infantry this time, and oh, you have to pay samurai for their services, so you get you're gonna have a, a gold drain while you fight, and oh, you can well, unlock gold powder by training with the Portuguese, for example, and it's every single mission is just a whole separate game. And I don't have the mentality right now to be able to handle that. It's also okay. has that sort of, since this is being made by fans, it's being made by people that really know how to play the game, and they expect oh, you oh. to really know how to play the game. Oh, it's the modder's dilemma. Yeah, I, and, I see. and so I, there's just certain things in here that I have no idea how to handle what you're throwing at me right now. Like, for the amount of enemies, like, what kind of... Am I not making enough defenses I never do in these sorts of games? Just what, what... What do you want from me, game? What do you want from me? No, it's... It's such a hard thing because... I have real trouble with mods. Like, speaking as someone who loves Warcraft 3 entirely because of its modded scene... And also the base game was good, but, like... Yeah. The yeah. modded scene was what kept it, me it's, there it's forever. Fun. No, I adore it. Um, I like mods... Generally, I don't play with them, and unless I really love and get into a game, they don't affect my experience to a significant degree. Mm -hmm. Like, I have to know a game before I start digging into its modding scene. And even then, I probably won't want to play much. Like, uh, I, I know it's weird for me to say, I don't really care much for Mario Party's modding scene. I, I'll be completely honest, I was not aware there was a modding scene for Mario Party. It just, I like dealing with what the hand of that original game was dealt. And I feel like you kind of lose the grass from the trees, so to speak. Oh, that I totally get. Yeah, there's a lot of... Once you can really start telling where the original game ended and the mod begins... Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to... Not from like a purist standpoint, but... If there's not that extra step taken to, like, make it mesh, it, it's just, it feels off. Yes. And, like, that that's not to say, oh, please stop modding. No, 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 never Absolutely stop not. modding. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Please indulge yourself. Like, I'm, I'm going through the XCOM mod right now, and that's been phenomenal. Because yeah. it, it takes that extra steps to really make it yeah. feel like it's just the game but more. Uh, the Terraria Thorium mod, I'd also go... It just requires that. more to hit a much larger audience when you're not at that level of community understanding and you're not right mm -hmm. there in the deep bedrock of it. Yeah, some Smash moves, that's a really good. There's a lot yeah. more that exist. There sure are. Oh, God. <laughs> there are a lot of people who sure do know how to put references in. For sure. For sure. Uh, yeah, all, all that said, I still love what this is. It, it's it's been by a mod maker that really clearly cares about history because all the changes are made to kind of better embrace what part of the world is being covered like there's a like there's one for francis drake and he's got like a full crew of just people from africa from from portugal from just all over the world and you get this really fun mesh of just all sorts of civilizations units very fun mm -hmm. but i this is going to be on the back burner for a while because i can't handle learning a dozen rts's back to back to back to back right uh, for my other uh, obligation, uh, new team fight tactic sets, and again, it's okay. 
Like it's it's still just as fun as it always yeah, is. Look, everyone, he's growing up. I I, I am. He's I am. branching it's out of his horrible. horizons. It's abysmal, but going from just the just the whole like okay the units that you have on your board change the background music just nothing was going to top that that's such a phenomenal hmm. gameplay mechanic that it's they, they, they have a fun like chinese mythology theme which is really cool to see it doubles down on the randomness but oh, so nice I, I i like the music i miss the music i want it back uh, oh gosh, all of my, all of my basic games. I'm just realizing now are mods. I have. Yes, I I, 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 I noticed might, that. I, I favor these a little more, apparently. Well, what, what can I say? I, I play a lot of PC games, and this is where they really, really shine. Uh, let's grab, let's grab one of the abyss. Next, uh, I talked about Heroes Three last time. Uh, one of my favorite games of all time, The Story of Sandro, is what I talked about. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is another game that has just a colossal modding scene, but very few of them manage to get to a point of quality, apart from one called Horn of the Abyss, which is uh, just kind of takes that kind of crazy fantastical setting, just kind of slowly integrates more factions into it. Like you'll have your basic, like, kind of Narnia castle with another elves and some demons and undead. This one has added a pirate one, a long time ago, like sea serpents, sorceresses, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And just last month, they added one for kind of steampunky Wild West, right after the cusp of Dune with sandworms and stuff, which was really, really cool to see. Uh, I wanted—I just wanted to give this one a shout out because I thought this project was very, very dead. Because Here's Three is very big in kind of the. Um, the, the Baltic regions, uh, the developers mm -hmm. are split between Ukraine and Russia, like, perfectly oh. split across the border. Oh, yikes. I thought this was just gone. Yeah, no, that, uh, that sounds like it. No, yeah, but they're all still doing it. And I think it's nice to have, to have small reminders like this that when shitty people aren't grasping for power and fucking everything up for everyone else, humans just kind of default into making cool stuff with each other. That's just what regular people do, and I like that. I just wanted to applaud that. Yes! No, just that's a very world. good thing! Yeah. All of what I said about the Age of Empires 2 being made for people, this is made for, like, people have been playing this for 20 years, mastered it, and that's literally it! Like, the aesthetic is wonderful. They have, like, cutscenes that perfectly capture the art style of the previous game. But mm -hmm. you, they just throw you into campaign missions where you've got, like, ten units and you're facing off against armies, and I just don't know what they're expecting me to do. But still, die. hats off to those developers. I'm so happy they're still doing it. And last but not least, I've, just, I've been on a binge of just StarCraft mods, because if... I would posit that this game is the king of making just super fun, goofy mods about whatever a modder's heart desires. It's just, like, like I did last time, just like two minutes explaining each one. I mm -hmm. talked about a uh, crew mod last time, where it kind of makes it into a roguelike, where you have a bunch of pilots for units, and if the units die, you just lose the pilots, so it's a limited resource of how many units you can train. Right. Super duper cool. Uh, those exist for each of the factions in this game. But the factions in this game are so different that they have to approach it in different ways, which is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, the Zerg have to hunt down biomass, like going after little random critters around the map to be able to like, use that biomass, integrate it to create more units. Uh, which is arguably the least interesting format of it, but the Zerg are a faction in and of itself where preservation is not the goal. And that's just super duper interesting, trying to take the swarmy race and figure out, okay, how do I make it so that all of my glass cannons don't die. Mm -hmm. That's a fun puzzle to solve. Uh, the Protoss get the cool thing. Because the Protoss whole lore thing is that when a warrior dies, they get put in a mech suit to allow them to continue fighting. So you get a split of, okay, you have a uh, 
the pool of warriors and the pool of mechs, and you can only get more mechs if your warriors die. Which just creates this super fascinating, like, push and pull of, okay, do I sacrifice more warriors to get more units of this type, or do I need to keep these around for, like, the psionic stuff? And it's just... I love the questions it poses. It's so neat. And that's it. Just oh, okay. Just fun StarCraft mods. I love that game. I it would be so nice if they started supporting it again. I am glad that your love can endure where mine cannot. Well, I, thankfully, my game still exists. Yours doesn't. Yes, but I don't know if I would still play it even if it did. <laughs> All right, I think that's all of my smaller ones. So hit me with, what else, what else you got? All right, is everyone ready for a weird, obscure PS1 title from my childhood? I'm so ready. Are you ready to be hit with the weirdest fucking game you'll ever play? Cause we're coming in hot with Tomba 2, The Evil Swine Return. Oh? Do you know anything about Tomba? Not a goddamn thing. I think I've seen... Wait! Wait! I think someone submitted this as a Peasant's Perspective moveset. I remember this. Okay, I have some slight understanding. But... All right. Very, awesome. very little. <laughs> Tomba 2 is a 2.5D platformer wherein you are on a 2D plane, but sometimes you will come to an intersection... And you can go either direction in the intersection, which will then bring you to a perpendicular 2D plane. And you just go through those. So it's like a 2D platformer, but it has depth. Mm -hmm. And you can play through the depth as well. Um, and it is incredibly innovative because it is a 2D platformer where the jumping fucking sucks. I'm watching gameplay. What is this Sonic Adventure 2 Knuckles Glide platform? What what is this? Uh that's not a glide. Oh, oh, that's the glide suit, yeah. Um so Tomba hates the ground. He hates it. There is no lore explaining that he hates the ground, but based on the ability to hit the jump button, he loathes being on the ground. I can tell that. Like from an instinctual level. Uh, this may, he ha so he has the floatiest jump known to mankind. This makes platforming miserable and jumping on enemies painful because you will overshoot them and then overcorrect and also overshoot them in the other way. This is before you get what you're seeing there, which is the glide suit, which causes you to get on the ground more slowly. Lovely. So your inability to make simple jumps makes platforming awful. Oh, this is her. Oh. No, yeah, this now, is hurting my brain trying to watch just the, oh, the perspective. So weird. Yeah. Now, the good thing about this game is that it doesn't give a shit about platforming. Okay. Because this is actually a game that is all fetch quests. Instead, you are just going to locations to get a crab for a person so that they can have a crab and unlock the next area for you. Okay. And you know what? There are like 180 quests in this game or something. Wow, all right. There's a lot of shit to do, and this game does an amazing job of signposting you of, like, this will be important in eight hours. There is a... It's like, this is a small door. A mouse could fit through here. After you do a fetch quest that requires you to scour the entire world, you gain the ability to shrink, but only in this door that's on the opposite side of the world. Sure. So then you have to go to the other side of the world unless you got the fast travel flying dog. As you do. Who is in the middle of the game where you need the holy water from the end of the game in order to unpetrify him. But you need to remember that the dog is there to get unpetrified. Because there's like three hours of bullshit in the clown village first. 
Sure. Okay. Now, the issue is that this game's translation is awful. Yes! But you have to understand that this game's translation is awful and it is fully voice acted. Oh, that's that's just the best. So you have weird sentence fragments that barely make sense done by voice actors who range from this is clearly some guy in the office to an actual voice actor doing the dumbest voice they possibly can. Please, like, please say they're reading that, like word for word the terrible translations. Yes. 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 It sounds like they were given each individual line in a vacuum and then just they stitched the lines together. And you can tell it's a rush job because you can hear an outtake from one of the voice actors left in the game as he's trying to get his <laughs> accent right. Literally, there is a squirrel in the game who is trying to explain where you have to go. And it's like, we need the tow tower, the tower. We need the tower. We need the tower. Ah, there we go. We need the towers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. But you also have to understand that halfway through the game, the game decides, yeah, our platforming does suck, and gives you the flying squirrel clothes, which are given to a man who sounds like he is probably a child predator, because he's reading his lines going, brr, brr, it's really cold out here without flying squirrel clothes. Hey, kid, do you want to go? We'll play a little game together. Because after you get the fire hammer from Santa Claus, you can get his diary. And his diary will reveal to you a green key. And next to him is the flying squirrel clothes that he wanted. But he couldn't find it because it was too cold. No, makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. So it's like Oblivion? No, I don't like Oblivion. I like this bad game. So it is a game where halfway through, it gives you one of the most powerful glide abilities, and then it gives you a grapple hook, like Bionic Commando. And guess what? The swinging controls for the grapple hook are actually good. Interesting. So your momentum then combos with the glide so that you can basically skip every screen of the game by flying over it, but only through skill. That, that does it is fun. like if Super Mario World sucked, but the cape was still good. Interesting. Okay. But then... It layers on top of that that there are five bosses and they have cursed the world. They are the evil swine foretold in the title who had kidnapped your friend Tabby, but not your monkey friend Charles. And in order to find them, you need an evil pig bag. And once you get the evil pig bag, if you go within three character lengths of the door, the door will reveal itself and you can fight the boss. These doors can be anywhere in the game. Oh no. They, I mean, they're in set places, but one of them is just in the middle of a platforming course. Completely unmarked. However, you can get hints, but there are two issues with that. Number one, the hints are even more poorly translated than the rest of the game. And two, you only get these hints by watering every single magic flower in the game with either hot or cold water, of which you can only use a bucket where you can only carry up to two buckets at a time. But you only get one bucket because that the second bucket is locked behind a minecart minigame. And this minecart minigame 
is the hardest thing in not just the game, but maybe most platformers. Okay. And guess what? The ability to get hints is also tied to the minecart minigame. Because there are pickups in the minecart minigame that only come into play nine hours later when you're hunting the final boss. And it's not told that you could be hunting him through these. It's just said it might be a good idea to collect these. So you think, oh, if I collect these, I can be faster in the minecart. No, they do jack shit for nine hours. And the minecart minigame is awful because it is a game where it is you're on a minecart. Your controls are lean to the left, lean to the right, and break. There is no acceleration. Go through this course without falling off. So you have to muscle memory your way through this course, figuring out the rules as you go, because if you go too fast and are leaning to one side, you'll fall off and have to restart. Of course. So you have to figure out, okay, I can't accelerate. And I can't take it slow because I'm carrying a bucket of cement that will harden in one minute and 16 seconds. So I have to get to the end before one minute or 16 seconds. Would you care to guess what the speed run time for this minecart minigame is? Oh. 11 seconds. One minute, 14 seconds, and 84 milliseconds. Oh, you, so there's no room for error. You have zero room for error. <laughs> no. And once you beat it, he goes, would you like to do it again? I've made the cart faster. This also has a one second margin for error, but now you're going faster, so it has fucked your muscle memory. So you have to learn the whole damn thing all this what <laughs> and then after you beat it the man gives you golden sun and once you have a mid gba rpg in your hands you have to collect the golden moon and the golden star too which are tied to other mini games all two of which are bad and then you have to find the secret towers, which can only be found by going to specific locations on the map and playing a song. You do not know what these locations are, and you need to finish two separate side quests per song, which are in side quest chains, so there are each about 10 side quests each, so you have to clear about 60 side quests to get to each of these towers, one of which is in an obscure part of the first area, which you would never go to, and looks like just room geometry. There is no hint to where it is, except that there will be a guy looking for the secret tower in the area saying, I am looking for the secret tower. Now, yeah, you, you've hit a point of chaos where I'm just lost. <laughs> like... And once you get all of those, you can go to the Golden Tower, because this actually isn't required to beat the game, this is just for 100%, but why wouldn't you do it? Because the entire game is fucking side quests. And a pig will be at the top of the tower, and he will go, let me see everything you've done. I see you have the Golden Sun, the Golden Moon, and the Golden Star, and you have the secret weapons. Here, you're invincible now. And you are just permanently invincible for the rest of the game. Which okay. you've already basically finished. The only thing you have to do left is boss fights, which are constructed in elaborate arenas that you don't have to interact with at all. Because all you have to do is jump on the boss's head and throw them in a bag three times. And they teleport next to you for all of their attacks. Sure. God, th yeah, this definitely is a definition of a hot mess of a game but this is fun? a this is a bad game and it's sometimes miserable i recommend this game to anyone <laughs> because it is a what the fuck am i supposed to do kind of game the whole time through and it's trying and sometimes you'll just go next to a guy and I'll be like oh no my precious pot is broken can you help me? Oh no, I have horrible depression now, Tomba. 
Oh, you fixed my paw. Thank you so much. And this is the actual voice acting. Of the game. Yes. Yes. This is Tomba 2, The Evil Swine Return. I have never played Tomba 1, but I'm told it's a good game. This is one of those games where I was like, why did I never beat this as a kid? I remember a lot about it. And I went, oh, I know why I remember a lot about it now. And why you didn't beat it. This is kind of endearing, but shit, dude. <laughs> and also the music is really good. They did a different soundtrack for the international release. And it's just catchy music all the way through. Except right. for the Haunted Forest, which for some reason is this Nightmare Before Christmas monstrosity of, like, scary chimes and children going, la, 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 No, 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 no. No, thank you. I'm good. But they keep doing it. And it's not poorly composed. It's just like, oh, shit. <laughs> this sounds miserable. It is, but, like... Are you going to stop playing it? Because I couldn't. <laughs> I I am expressing all of this to everyone to go, please track down Tomba 2. Please look at it. Please try to beat that fucking minecart section. It's within the first two hours of the game. You don't have to beat it. It's for the optional content. But, like, you should beat it. It's for the experience. Builds character. <sighs> I miss when games could just be shit like this. Because this is taking every wild swing that it possibly can. It is way too ambitious for a PS1 title. It is trying its goddamn best. And it's failing... But I'm never going to forget Tompa 2. Popeye 2? Fuck that. I'm going to forget that in a week. Tompa 2? Nah, that's sticking with you. That, that hits. <laughs> Lovely. <sighs> Alright. Check it out. Your turn. Okay. I'm trying to remind myself what I have again. One second. I uh, let's go. Let's talk about the XCOM streams. Those were fun. Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah. So this, well, not not this month, but this is when I decided to like really double down and try to make this sort of thing work with the modded mishaps I've been doing. And uh, this, <laughs> I I did two streams this month. Uh, mm -hmm. finished the first playthrough and started the second playthrough because the first one was awful. I, no, I know. I saw the video. I very foolishly tried to approach this mod while trying to play at the same crushing difficulty I usually play XCOM with, and that does not work. Especially if you're trying to play viewer characters in a way that would make sense with their characters. Because that's... That's... No. Oh, yeah, no, you you can't roleplay on hard mode, buddy. No, not even a little bit. Uh, it was hilarious, though. Like, some, some truly great moments of characters surviving way longer than they should have. But, sadly, everybody died. Literally everybody died. But the second go-around... Now, this... This has just been a, an absolute delight. Difficulty's low enough that you can actually get away with just being like, No, okay, this is this is the... This is Terminal Montage's speedrunner Link, so obviously he's going to try to go through these missions as optimally as physically possible. Could he get killed right here? Doesn't matter. He's charging in full front. Yeah. And it just kind of works, and it's the most Good. beautiful thing I've ever seen. <laughs> there, there was one moment where there were just a bunch of soldiers all clustered together, like perfect rocket launcher target right there. But mm -hmm. there were three civilians hiding with them at the same time, which created like a two minute debate with chat and going back over the character's backstory to being like, okay, so it, is, how does this person feel about war crimes? Is, okay, just going through the chat. It's, it's, it's an entertainer. He's just kind of shy. Doesn't understand the severity of their situation. Say no more. Fire in the <laughs> hole. <laughs> 
Oh, it's 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 been it's just a treat. XCOM is in this perfect, just sweet spot that allows for this kind of audience interaction while still being like a very complex and chaotic game. I'm sorry, I'm just imagining a shy or tear going like. They'll be talking about this on podcasts within 15 years. No, but exactly, though. It's good content. That's all that matters. And now that people aren't dying anymore, there's, like, actual narratives starting to form, because that's what XCOM 2 does so well. Between all of the, the limitless customization, the photo booths, the dozens and dozens of aliens that characters can... Maybe this character just really gets... just misses every shot against this one, or constantly panics when this one throws a grenade. Like, there's so many bizarre patterns that can happen, and they're all so mm -hmm. fun. Like, with this being a mod, we have we have the archer from Clash of Clans, just, just because, just because, you know. Uh, yeah. Her cloak has bugged out, and kind of just hovers two feet behind her at any given time. So we've just decided that, okay, so clearly there's a dead unit from the previous run possessing that cloak, and now people in chat are trying to figure out who the hell it is. Oh, oh. it's uh, Dahlia Briarwood, clearly. But who else would it be? No, you're right. Like, she won't go away. Kind of over relying on the character a bit. Uh, there's a there's a there's a tunified Mario that can be in best of friends with that war criminal from before because he just throws grenades happily all over the place. So logically, it's a match made in heaven. Uh, I just added Prince Zuko to the roster. And I can't wait for him to use every fire munition imaginable. Oh it's shit! So much honor. Especially because the, like, overall goal of XCOM 2 is to deal with a project known as the Avatar Project. Which oh, just no. kind of meshes so <laughs> perfectly, right? <laughs> God, it's, it's been, I've been having the timeline. My only regret is that Usopp was unavailable to join when I asked him. Like, like, like he, he was down for it, of course, mm -hmm. but not, he wasn't scared or anything. He just had more important things to do. But but thankfully, Soka King, his loyal friend from Sniper Island, has been a great oh, asset dude. to the team. I love Soka King. He was born on Sniper Island. Right? The bravest man out there. Like, I'm not saying that everyone should watch those streams, because I get it. They're long. There's lots of downtime to customize characters. But please... At least toss a few characters into the mix. Because it is so funny seeing these radically different juxtaposed characters just collide into each other in this randomized turn-based blender. And experiencing the mod has been really fun too. Like this is, now that it's at a manageable difficulty, this has been a delightful challenge realizing, oh, that's an orange soldier. I don't know what that is. What are they called? Rocketeer? Rocketeers? Oh no. Oh. Oh dear. It's just been a delightful time. Would highly recommend. Good, good. All right, back to you. All righty. So, as you all might know, I am something of an aficionado when it comes to silly racing games. By which I mean I am a snob who will say Mario Kart derivative. Adequate. <laughs> Oh, not, not up to the snuff of the F-Zeros of the world. Oh, gosh. What, you... Ah, oh, you finally caught up to Diddy Kong Racing, have you, Mario Kart 7? Isn't that cute for you? So, I wanted to check out something that had been recommended to me and something that I hadn't touched since the Wii U era. And, uh... And that I hadn't touched this prequel to either. And that is Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing. The first one. Okay, tell me about this because I have n no context for any of how this game works. I know that okay. Heavy's in it and that's it. Uh, no, that's the second one. This is the oh, first one. So this is the worst one. No, well, no, because this one on the Xbox has Banjo and Kazooie in it. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, Neat. but they're in their nuts and bolts design. Oh, Monkey but yeah, right um, so this is such an interesting game because it is so solidly reverent to Sega and so fun and celebratory of it, while also clearly being on a horrible budget. 
because damn, they sure did make seven of the or like nine of the racetracks themed around Sonic Heroes assets, didn't they? Oh, but that's so fun, though. Yes, but every set of three is actually fun because you get custom music. So uh, for the ones based on Seaside Hill, you can have Palm Tree Panic from Sonic CD, or you can have Super Sonic Racing. Ooh, okay. And it's like, you can set them for each course. It's quite fun. Um, there's a full set of three racetracks on House of the Dead. And those are all great. Um, the interesting thing about the first game is that this wasn't really based on a kart racing base. It was based on OutRun as the basis. Really? Yes. So with OutRun as his basis, it controls smooth as butter. Like, there is just such a natural curve and feel to all of these cars that your lines are fantastic. Gliding through the game feels beautiful. The issue with this game is that, unfortunately, most of the stages are just very light turns. I was about to say, like, I'm watching the course design here, and mm -hmm. it sure is colorful. It is. It's incredibly colorful. Try to see if you can find one of the Samba de Amigo tracks. No, I'm, I'm looking at the Samba de Amigo tra oh, track. Oh, right yeah. Now. Yeah, and, it, yeah. It, and wow, it's a fun visual to look at, spectacle. Wow, just... are you not doing much? Yeah, no, a lot of the tracks are just very basic turns into other turns. Hmm. And it feels really good. But unfortunately, there's not much there, and the item system is not great. It's just kind of there. There's a bunch of items that are just like, eh, it's fine. And then there's the all-star item, which is unique to every character and plays their theme song when you oh, use that's it. fun. And they're fun, but it's also a, wow, you just kind of won, didn't you? Because that oh. item is so better than every other item in the race. Okay. It is like if you had a bullet bill that shot red shells <laughs> for a Mario Kart equivalent, <laughs> Okay, that would kind of be what it feels like. However, you do have the fun of Big the Cat's tiny motorcycle that he is too big for turning into Froggy, who is giant now, as he latches on with a little pole to follow him as he drags oh, him so around. It's, it's like just the, the baby chain Yeah! And, the babies. yeah. <sighs> and also, this game has wild poles. It has the mice from Choo Choo Rockets all in a tiny little modeled rocket ship. The Dreamcast puzzle game. I've it has the Bonanza Brothers from Bonanza Brothers sure. who are just gangsters, but they're modeled as like Lego Sega Genesis characters. Oh, that's actually cool, though. Yeah. Yes. They're really fun. Uh, none of it matters because Ulala is in the game, so of course I'm picking her. Love Space Channel 5 to death. But yeah, um... This game is kind of faulted by its course design and its physics system. Because unfortunately, y you know when you can tell, ah, uh, this game was certainly made in a physics engine. Uh -huh. And it certainly isn't working for this jump every single time. God, the, the Lava Billy Hatcher stage does not work. It is... Because if you go... On a turbo boost, you will hit the edge of the third platform and your car will just kind of teeter on the edge for a while. And then you'll fall off and then you'll respawn. It is very not optimized for any sort of 3D collision. And that's the rough part about it. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Which is... Now, everything I said does not apply to the Super Monkey Ball courses. Because for some reason, the Super Monkey Ball courses are mean, filled with 90 degree turns, function really well, and are a blast. Okay. 
I don't know why it's only the three monkey ball courses that are good in this game, but all three monkey ball courses hit and monkey target in specific where you're shot out of a giant cannon into one, the glider section from Super Monkey Ball 2 mm -hmm. into a series of 90 degree turns on top of a pirate tower where you have to let go of the brake while drifting in order to do a clean turn which can be meddled with with items, I'm like, holy shit. This is fantastic. Cool. Like, this is one of the best kart racing courses I've ever been on. And it's Monkey Target. There we go. Found footage of it. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, this is a yeah. lot. No, compared to the freaking Samba de Amigo nice little turns that it does. And that's just a baby course. That's the easiest monkey ball course you're looking at. Is that... Wait, is that... Is that Shenmue, dude? Yeah, that's Ryu Hazuki from Shenmue. Sure. <laughs> yeah, he's looking for some sailors. <laughs> also, there's a mission mode in this game. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes they have boss fights, and all the boss fights are awful. Lovely. Yeah, you have... The two guys from Virtua Fighter in the car from Outrun? Like, this game goes wild. Sure. Oh, okay. Sure. Now, it, it hurts me because I tasted how good this game could be. Because I still think that it's still pulling even with, like, an average Mario Kart. Mm -hmm. it, albeit my standard for Mario Kart is like, Mario Kart's pretty good. But it, it needs some work. It has some clear issues. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, it has a sequel. Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing Transformed. Actually, no, it's just Sonic and All-Stars. Sega isn't important because there are non-Sega All-Stars in this. And this game fucking rules. Okay, okay. Because this takes all of the concepts from the initial game and are like, okay... Here's that great control. We've refined it so that physics fucky-wucky doesn't happen as often anymore. We have changed all of the courses so that now sharper turns are still a part of it. And we have taken the Mario Kart 7 gimmick of land, air, and sea and made seamless transitions in between them and interacted through each stage so that they change per lap. If Mario Kart is the standard, this is the Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze of kart racers. This is every single course is a freaking story from start to finish. Coming from you, that's an interesting comparison. Is Isn't it? it? So, so, so where does the problem arise? We'll get there. Okay. Because I need to gush about this game. Because every single course is this beautiful transition. Like, take the uh, Knights into Dreams course to start with. Oh, uh, that sounds amazing. Yeah. Completely in the air and then on the boat. So there is no land. Uh, you start in this lush, lovely Knights forest that you're very standard with. Then you warp into a boss dimension and you have a mini boss fight with one of the Knights villains during each lap, which can include ducking through various nightmare and windows, following Puffy as she tries to lure you into traps. Mm -hmm. And the first, whoever is in first place will have to react to her bursting through a wall and get to that wall as she's bursting through it. That sounds so cool, though. And then everyone else has to follow them. And the third lap, you have Wiseman, the villain of knights, creating patterns of meteors up and down and waves for you to dodge. And if you're in first place, he will mock you relentlessly, telling you to give in and submit to him. Your reward for getting in first place is cinematic brilliance, which then leads to a fantastic downhill rapid section as you're ducking and weaving through different things to find the best course. But at, if you go in one way, there's a jump that instantly gets you to a fly pad that gets you back to the loops and the loops in the first section change per lap so that you're 
going through a different area of the forest. It's so cool. Yeah, this is gorgeous. I'm, it just went to the transition to the to the darker yes. area after the forest. Wow. Oh, just colors. No, it's such a spectacle. The Samba de Amigo tracks, still in there. Still great. They have a cup that is just four of the original courses that they've just left in and are like, yeah, no, 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 we know. But, like, if you just want pure racing, here are four. No flying, no boats. Just go through. There is so much love put into these courses. Tracks based on, like, freaking Shinobi 3, based on Afterburner. Based yeah. on skies of Arcadia. Yeah! Where a sky pirate barrage blows up the course in front of you, and you have to fly over the remains of the course that you just drove past a minute ago. That's sick! Isn't it? There's a course based on Golden Axe. You know, the old beat em up, no, I, I medieval love fancy beat em up? I, I'm, I'm familiar. Death Adder's Lair. Perfectly translated. Yes! How have I not heard more about this As you're game? boating over lava to a remix of the Golden Axe theme that is so <laughs> triumphant. Forget da 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 As you're dodging pendulums of axes before a volcano erupts in the background and destroys the track on the third lap. I'm just cycling through footage now just trying to find all these because they all sound amazing yes oh but my absolute favorite course in the game burning depths based on burning rangers which is like a sega mecha firefighting game where you're just like disaster relief people you go through a mission of Burning Rangers where you're in an aquatic base, actively trying to race through it as it is collapsing, with comms constantly telling you the, the proper way to go, reassuring you, while they have this upbeat Sega-ass Burning Rangers theme in the background going, We are Burning Rangers, wow! They will never let you down! It has tight turns that go in every which direction. You do massive boat jumps that are influenced by water physics that feel amazing in this course. You can cut corners to such a degree, massive spirals as a dolphin tank explodes behind you. It is a brilliant, constant sprint. One of the best race courses I have ever had the pleasure of driving on. Oh no, yeah, I'm, I'm watching footage of that one now as well. And God, the, the really tight quarters combined with aquatic mobility. Yes. That's just that's just a water slide. Yes. That's so cool. Oh my god. So yeah, no, this game is cool. This game is amazing. The items suck. There it is. Okay, I, I just kept waiting. Yeah, um, so, unfortunately, every single item in this game is single targeting. So what? it hits... Yeah, it uh, hits the person in front of you, or it's like a single shot. There are, like, three different variants of the green shell. So if you are in the middle of the pack, you are staying in the middle of the pack. Because the only way to really get ahead is to take out the person in front of you. And when mm -hmm. that person is behind you, they will then take you out. Yep. yep the yep. only exception to this is the all-star item, which is still broken, but it drops a lot more often and puts you into a natural flying state where you are going at max speed with maximum stats, no matter what your character is. Oh, that's fun. And, and, and depending on your character, you'll have different attacks. And some of these are much better than others. Naturally. Namely, Eggman. You know, some characters are just like, we're going to create a little force field. Gum from Jet Set Radio understands, understands the concept of love. So she can spam giant electrocuting hearts behind her infinitely. Eggman has homing missiles that hit three people in front of you. And he still gets the speed boost. 
I don't know how you're supposed to beat Eggman. Thank God he's the last unlockable. He's the last unlockable? Yes, you have to beat all of the courses mirrored in order to unlock Eggman. Every other character is tied to the mission mode, but Eggman, you have to beat the game. Huh. Okay, sure. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> Especially with the other characters on this roster. like The I roster is good and interesting. Like, it has Riala from Knights, and he turns into his own car because he's a dream. So he, he can turn into anything. Same thing with Knights. They turn into the car and the plane and have a little NPC from Knights drive them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. BD Joe from Crazy Taxi is here, and his taxi just gains wings and jet boosters. It's amazing. Then you have Pudding, a character from Space Channel 5 that even I don't like. You have Wreck-It Ralph. You have professional racer Danica Patrick. Is this the Spartan from that one, like, Xbox? You have the guy from Total War. You have Football Manager. What? You have a Billy Hatcher course, but not Billy Hatcher. To be a fly on the wall when this roster was decided. Like, what Now, to be was... fair, you, you do have Ages, who is a sentient outrun car who transforms into the jet from Afterburner, Fuck who transforms yes. into, when on the water, a sentient Sega Dreamcast controller. <laughs> you have the Team Fortress 2 mercs, who are not voiced by the TF2 people, and it's very obvious. Oh. You're gonna get the license, but... Oh. And there is something of an issue occasionally with you're dealing with water physics oh. in the boat sections. And that can be very unreliable. I do think that they're good physics in general, but there is the possibility. And there's one jump specifically in the Billy Hatcher level. It's always the fucking Billy Hatcher level mm -hmm. where if you're going at it with any sort of speed, the transition into the water area, you will hit a wall of ice and just drop so you have to drop your speed immediately for that this makes the mission modes are actually really great because like this game is fantastic i i went whole hog into this like i've gotten four stars which is the secret difficulty that unlocks after you beat everything in three stars for the first three for the first five worlds of mission mode on everything and I've gotten the best times of all of my friends on expert mode of the Grand Prix. The Grand Prix and the actual races significantly harder than the rest of the game. Just because you're dealing with item randomness mm -hmm. and AIs that are driving really well. I think that this is an amazing, incredible time trial game. I don't quite think it hits the peak of kart racing. But, like, it could fight Diddy Kong Racing. And that's coming from me. All right. Well, is this the kind of game you'd love to see them try again with? And just kind of learn more from Mystic Thing? Yes, but th that was Sonic Team Racing, and they didn't. They, oh. they unlearned. That's unfortunate. Like, would I love the best version of this, which actually has a Space Channel 5 race course because two games and somehow that didn't happen? Breaking my fucking heart? Yes. So you're saying Billy Hatcher levels are accurate to the source material? Unfortunately. Coo 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 coo. It's, I think it's hilarious seeing Cam freak out about this, ages in particular, because I specifically remember Cam submitting a moveset for a GameCube controller for Peasant's Perspective, and that's making a lot more sense right now. Oh, wait. Oh, shit. No, I lied. It is the Hornet from Daytona. It's not OutRun Car. They added an OutRun stage, and I got mixed up. I'm sorry. That's right, because Ryo Hazuki is in this game, and he's driving an OutRun arcade cabinet. That's my bad. Okay, okay. What is my best kart racer list look with this game in mind? Crash. Crash. 
Diddy. Oh gosh, it's hard between this one and MK8 Deluxe, but it could clear the entire Mario Kart franchise. Okay, so but top five? Top five, yep, yep. Okay, nice. This is like... Cool. This is not in my top 100, but it is above Pizza Tower. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, 102? Yes! All right, sure. I just updated my top 100 on my Twitter, and uh, this was, like, it was between this game and Kirby 64. Oh, okay, I, I appreciate... That, that, that's, that warms my heart, that I think it's priority. Yeah. It's really good. Oh, yes, and the announcer. I forgot about the announcers. In the first game, he's, like, super invested in every race, and he's, like, a weird Saturday morning cartoon announcer. And then in the second game, he's a very standard announcer, but he, if you consider him an annoying, you can turn down his volume, and he will beg you not to turn him off because he has a wife and kids, and this is the only job he has. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love that. Yes. So, yeah, this game's really good. Um, I probably obsessed over it a little too long, but I think it's worth it for everyone to just go through it because... The first time you play through this game, it will be the best kart racer you have ever played. It makes the absolute strongest first impression it possibly can. And it's only after playing it repeatedly that the cracks showed. Nice. All right. I'll admit, I'm, I've never been much of one for kart racers, but you're, you're kind of speaking to me with a few of the... I, I at least am going to go through the tracks and just see... You you should! Because a lot of these are speaking to like some really heavy nostalgia. I, I need to hear the afterburner theme that comes in from this game. Yeah, no, no, it's all good. Like, you should, you should play it. Because there's... You launch from one afterburner cruiser to another one. <laughs> That's They're really just good. two pa parallel really aircraft good. carriers. All right, and you'll be ones... like, "No!" It, when you go to Death Adder's Lair, you'll be like, "This is what Mount Doom would be if I raced on it." Don't, oh God! Don't... <laughs> From what you described to the rest of this roster, I could see that happening in the next game, and I would die. Yeah. Huh, okay, yeah. That's that. Uh, go. Okay. Uh, let's grab... Uh, let's grab this one. It's, it's, it's a small thing, but I found it incredibly interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, because... I, I rarely get a chance to talk about this game because I don't play it at all. However, I follow the lore religiously, mm -hmm. and that game is League of Legends. Yeah, okay, fair. Yeah, so don't worry, everybody. We're not talking about gameplay or anything like that. Uh, cause, but there was a fascinating update to the game's lore here. Uh, they've been doing a uh, an effort to update really old champion designs for a while now, because this was game was released in like 2009, and some people look horrible mm -hmm. and the most recent one to come out was a character named Skarner do you have any idea who that is no okay okay so brief overview of who Skarner used to be uh, really just a sad scorpion wandering around underground regions last of his kind trying to find someone else but just lost lonely not much of a character but kind of just a Admittedly depressing, but also just kind of pulls him a little bit. You wanted to give him a hug. Mm -hmm. But the effect he had on the lore was fascinating. Because Skarner is a Brackern. And when, uh, I can't remember if it's when they die or uh, like when they're trying to avoid death. But when, th when that happens, they will coalesce into these very small little blue crystals. 
that have magical capabilities. Okay. Which, if you've seen Arcane, I thought, at least, you know what those were. Because up until Skarner's we were here, the way that Piltover's whole prosperity was working was off mm -hmm. the backs of literally using the souls of these people to fuel their technological advancements. Which was yeah. absolutely fascinating, because it provides so many, like, rippling effects of, okay, what, who's, who's the bad guy here? What, this is like kind of just the, okay, Utopia is built off of the suffering of other people, right? Yeah, 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 Final Fantasy VI, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it balances the scales a lot more in terms of just the Zaun Piltover struggles, because Piltover is, is just doing some pretty shitty stuff with this. Mm -hmm. And I was really, really expecting that, that to be a huge payoff in Arcane. And I couldn't wait for that to happen. And then Skarner got reworked. So who Skarner okay. is now, There, he is a, uh, first off, he's colossal now. Just absolute kaiju where beforehand he was like 20 feet long, something like that. So big, but mm -hmm. right. he's kind of like a primordial titan-like character that is deep beneath the realms, the earth in one of the realms of Runeterra. Mm -hmm. just, a, just a subterranean guardian listening to the vibrations of the people above him. He's isolated his realm from the rest of the world to protect him from the onslaught of the devilish void entities. And the lore he used to have doesn't seem to be there anymore. The whole connection okay. to, like, Hextech, the Blue Crystals, I, I, I guess they could still do it, but there's not a hint of that anywhere at all. And given how mm -hmm. the how Arcane set up the like, you remember when Victor was staring into the Hexcorn and starting to become all purpley and stuff? Yes, that is the void in uh, Runeterra. Oh, I like purple. Yeah, which seems to be what they're doing now. Mm -hmm. But it's just I, I I just wanted to talk about it because it's such a fascinating case study of how difficult it is to keep up a consistent lore setup when you've got so many cooks in the kitchen at any given time. Because rightfully, they're deciding to focus on Arcane as, like, the main canon source of storytelling with this game, because, right. because Arcane is perfect, right. and it, it probably should be the focus. Yeah. But this is having really bizarre ripple effects, because this isn't just Skarner. Like, there's a, there's a character named Camille in Piltover, whose whole character is centered around keeping this soul farm a secret. Like, she knows, she's keeping it from everyone else, and that's just gone now. There's another character mm -hmm. named Seraphine who can hear the Bracken whispering to them and is trying to be, like, an equal rights activist to get people to stop using the souls to power all the machinery. That can't exist either. And I just... I, I don't have much of a point with this. I just think it's so interesting, because so many people nowadays are trying to have these massive, uh, like, open-ended stories, like you have the Marvel Cinematic Universes and all that. Right. And I don't think anybody's been able to pull it off well, just because of this issue of, okay, how are you going to write a consistent story when you've got a dozen writers? Well, quite frankly, you're either not meant to, or you're an animated series. Um... We had this issue for decades now in just getting any sort of non-game Halo content made, because every time a Halo movie would get made, um, they stuck to the Halo Bible, and the Halo lore master would go, every time a writer wanted to do a cool idea, we'd go, no, 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 we have this right here in the book. Yeah, you can't do that. That's incorrect. And every writer would get fed up and leave. Mm hmm because they adhered to the canon of Halo so tightly that it smothered creativity. And that's usually why most Halo projects are mid, that if is... that. Well, I mean, you say that, but the TV series wasn't Halo at all, which is a weird juxtaposition to all of that. Well, yes. Well, yes, that is a, well, fuck it at that point. Mm -hmm. Like, this is when Bungie was still a thing. I, I saw someone say that it seemed to be a Mass Effect show that just got retooled because that was the brand they could get and it kind of makes a lot of sense from reading from that lens yeah but yeah, yeah there's there's this 
interesting just uh, dichotomy at play between needing to adhere to that source material and letting the writers breathe Mm -hmm. and how much you're able to do that for a I don't want to call League a beloved IP I think think you could just with how much like Fortnite's a beloved IP too but you wouldn't say well yes but like there is more love than hate in Fortnite even I could recognize that I'm not going to from the perspective of lore though I think you could say there's more love than hate there like people love to say that. Like, I don't League. believe that the people who can recite that lore have more love than hate in their hearts. <laughs> nah, that creed's pretty cool. I'll defend a creed. He's like the lore master of the, like on the YouTube side. Well, yeah, so- you're allowed to have one guy who's really cool, but fair enough. Fair enough. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. What what, what was the point of that? <laughs> you said that you didn't really have a point. Oh, right, yeah, I don't. But I, I, I just think it's so interesting to see that, because you see so many people try to take their own spins on various beloved IPs. Sometimes it works, mm-hmm. sometimes it doesn't. But it's fascinating to look at. And that 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 that's it. I just wanted to talk about Skarna for a bit. Alrighty. Okay. Alright. So... I have two, technically three more things to talk about here. I know one of them will be more popular with the crowd, but one of them I want to end on. So go, go, go for the popular one. That's what the people have been waiting yeah, for. Yeah, let's go. So um, for those of you who aren't chilling, uh, every Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, I have been doing streams on the Design 4 channel. We've been hanging out, having a good time, and for my inaugural streams, we have been playing the first two games in the Pikmin series. Pikmin 1 and Pikmin 2. Indeed. Um, I've completed Pikmin 1, and I have erased the debt of Pikmin 2. What is your familiarity with the Pikmin series, before I go into anything? I have played every single game apart from the 3DS 2D platformer thingamabob. Uh, All right. I, I enjoy them a lot. None of them quite make it into my top 100, but I think, like, in, in a similar vein with the Sonic All-Stars, they're, they're, like, 130 to 100. I think you'd be able to find most of them in that range. I, I enjoy get the you. series a lot. It's just that, like, our RTS games are, like, my thing. Mm-hmm. So when I play through these, I just kind of want a little bit more. But they're still very, very fun games for me. I love the multitasking aspects. I love how frenetic they can get. I love the bonds it creates with your Pikmin and how horrifying they can feel when they die. And just kind of that push and pull, push and pull, trying to be mm-hmm. as efficient as possible while also keeping your soldiers alive. Right. So to go over my experience with Pikmin, um, I played it as a $7 used game from a GameStop, um, like five years after its release. I got to Puff Stool. It turned all of my good little boys into delinquents. They attacked me, and then they all died because the day ended. And they were still delinquents. And that's what you get for leaving daddy. And then I turned off the game, and I said, I will pick this back up. And I never picked it back up. So now, going through Pikmin 1 now is... Pikmin 1 is such a fascinating game because... It's simultaneously very clearly a tech demo for the GameCube Mm -hmm. is very obviously just trying to show off a lot of capabilities and making a game around that. And then they're filling in the gaps in really fascinating ways, by which I mean Nintendo actually got off their asses and decided to write a story and write a good character story. Right! And every time that Captain Olimar speaks is fantastic. He's such a great character. He has this sort of detached observational feeling, but he still falls for scams and online issues. He's like, he's an idiot, but he's also just like a humble family man, but he is so fascinated in the world around him. There is an infectious energy about how much he loves exploring this world and getting the chance to do something other than freight delivery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's so cool. Um, the game itself is 
I would call it cute. It's a very interesting thing of everything in the world is out to get you, and once you know how to handle it, it is no longer scary, but until then, it is the most terrifying thing in the world. And that is just the basic concept of man versus nature and Pikmin nails it in a way that is almost without dialogue no, yeah. or explanation or tutorial. It is just there and expressed through gameplay. It is beautiful. I wish the gameplay was better. <laughs> Pikmin one in particular. Pikmin I... one has such a unique and fun message that is completely at odds with its desire to be a score attack game. Mm -hmm. Because the moment that you strip that fear away and just turn it into pure optimization, it becomes significantly less interesting of a game, but significantly better mechanically. But when you are at the mercy of that fear, your mechanics kind of go out the window and you're just sort of losing on purpose to get better. It's it's like a fighting game when you lose on purpose to get better and then eventually you're better mm -hmm. and you feel good. The issue being that once you are at that level, you're missing out on the heart of the game. It's like after you become a master of Ryu, they take away the sound effects and the characterization and the music. And you are just, this is the function of Ryu. It is a mannequin. Mm -hmm. That's what I feel when you get good enough at Pikmin 1 specifically. Everything stripped down sort of sadly becomes. Um, also, Pikmin AI fucking sucks. I, I want the, that on the, record. The pathing in 1 and 2 specifically is abysmal. I want to know, I had a full squad, I'm like, okay, these are my 100 strongest soldiers going into the final boss. I go to the middle of the bridge and walk across. By the end of the bridge, I go, these are my 80 strongest soldiers. <laughs> uh, there are ways to get them to maneuver a little tighter, but even then, they'll constantly get caught on little jutting bits of terrain. The terrain in some places seems actively designed to catch them like that. Yes. It's just annoying. Swarm button moment? No, because then the instant you release them from the swarm, they stop. They just... And Lord help you if they're in a sort of situation where there's water even remotely nearby. I have had three Pikmin massacres to water, and none of them were my fault. Uh, they all were very fun to watch, though. I've been, I've been watching all no, of these streams it just as a second monitor thing, and it is just so, so delightful to hear the agonizing cries of, Why would you do that? He's, n he's not very intelligent. I appreciate the Switch port making the Yellow Pikmin slightly smarter about Bomb Rocks. However, <laughs> my god... Time. That one man who decided, realize. I don't need to live. <laughs> I'm going to set this bomb rock and immediately deactivate. Excuse me, my cat wants out. One second. That's all right. That's all right. What, you want freedom? You want freedom? You go? He is free. Huzzah. Mr. Krabs, walk here. It, 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 it's been so funny watching you deal with mechanics, not understanding how they work. Like, trying to do, like, swarming combat while a couple of your dudes are still holding bomb rocks. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. Or going against enemies that, oh, this is electric, but you don't know that yet. Yes, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, So, ultimately, I feel like Pikmin 1 is a game that was destined to be a cult classic. Yes. Because there is a significant amount of jank to it, but the message behind it ultimately is so unique and pure and weird for Nintendo specifically that, like, if that hit you, that hit you. 
Um, especially if you had the original version and they still played the Strawberry Flower songs, which sadly had been removed from the Switch versions for copyright reasons. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, if if that hit you... Pikmin 1 is a game where I feel that it could never be more than a cult classic because it would need to evolve the series in some way in order to give it a more... I don't want to say casual appeal, but just appeal out of a very specific window of oh, yeah. I am really in this for the lore, and then I really want to speedrun the game afterward. Yeah, it, it's a big thing I want of it. It's, it's, I like what it does, but there's so many gameplay opportunities that it flirts with, especially for that. It just I, I know what this can be when they drive mm -hmm. harder. And then they try something different in Pikmin 2. And they make it a dungeon crawler. And they go, you know that time limit that was cool in the entire point of the first game? Gone. Doesn't matter. Guess what? You go inside. You activate the world, though. Nothing moves. Time doesn't matter. You could do whatever you want in there. Mm -hmm. And it becomes entirely based on its resource management. And I'm going to freely admit to you, I wasn't really feeling the first part of Pikmin 2. Most people don't. I was like, I was like, this is fine. This is good. But, and gameplay-wise, it is working better. But I am losing the sense of exploration. I am losing that sense of fear and trepidation in favor of a very narrow view of fear, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Because eventually, once you get to the dungeons, you go, okay, I have this group. We're going to scout out. Okay, we've scouted it out. The The reds are expendable. They're always expendable. So we just go up to this little area. Okay, okay, did I lose a red? Doesn't matter. As long as I still got, like, five whites in the background. Am I going to use purples? Not really. Purples are broken. Even I could tell that, and I'm an idiot. That, like, <laughs> being able to have a stun on command is busted. I'm not going to stop using them because I want to feel the full feeling of the game. And I don't know when that's going to bite me in the ass. But, like, when I say on stream that this is a baby game for children, I mean it. It's like a game that is surprisingly forgiving and is more of a checklist of things for you to do while sacrificing the nature of it. Now, admittedly, Pikmin still has its best element, which is when it turns into a horror game. Because every time that nature does something that you don't expect, every time that there is a creepy plant that turns into a giant monster with big lips that eats you, <laughs> and then you realize, oh no, the giant monster with big lips that eats you is an idiot. Thank God. And you go, what the hell is that? It's like, it's so cool. But then you see Bull Blacks, and he's significantly weaker than he was in Pikmin 1, to the point of being a joke. Yep. So I'm like, ah, Pikmin is really appealing. They really took that feedback into account to make it more, you know, appealing to a mass market. I don't like it significantly less, but I like it less. Anyway, then Submerge Castle. That, oh god, that... Just waiting with bated breath for you to finally get around to that. I, I want to freely I say, for. if the rest of Pikmin 2 was like a 6.5, that was a 9.5. That was everything I wanted, because it takes the setup of those previous dungeons. It takes everything that you had done, and it turns it against you. All of the simple puzzles that are just, use this guy, use the yellow guy on the electricity, use the red guy on the fire, use the white guy to do everything, unlike most white people. You know. It takes that, and it's like, no, here is the least useful form of Pikmin. Figure it out. Every single step that you take is going to be a struggle as you're slowly whittling your way through and you're like okay I'll take it slow 
I'll take it easy. It dumps a giant fireman right in front of you, and he'll probably kill a lot of guys right off the bat. And you'll be like, okay, I have to just bait him. I have to put him in the water holes and figure out the best way to do it while losing as little of my resources as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then five minutes pass, and a big friend comes. Why is this the best horror villain in video games? It's so good. Why is this guy Nemesis Resident Evil, but actually good? The fact that he actually stalks you, that he isn't just a force of nature, that he's coming for you specifically. That he's looking for your Pikmin as they're carrying things out, that you cannot properly multitask, that you cannot stay still and tackle everything. Everything that the game has taught you is thrown out the window, and your style of play must change immediately into one of fear and panic. Mm hmm And that, that may cause a guy to throw a bunch of Pikmin onto an electric spider and then go, oh, he's dead, and look over at chat, and then hear a bunch of death screams and look back over and see 25 corpses floating into the sky. <laughs> and realize, oh, we're down to the tens of Pikmin left. It was so good. <laughs> and then when everyone is telling you, go out, go and leave... And you Cowards. don't think the Pikmin will respawn. So you think that, no, we got to do it anyway. And then you're down to only the Bulbmen who are in dungeon encounters that you have to figure out. And everyone in chat is annoyingly telling you just hurry up or leave. And everyone is trying to time you when you're explicitly telling them not to give you hints. But, yeah, that's that's just streaming. It is. Yes. It was incredibly frustrating. But it also created a perfect sense of panic in an environment. And when you go, okay, we got to the end, we can bail out. And we're like, no, we can, wait, we have purples. We can kill him. And then wondering, you how do we kill him? You had nine by that point. I had nine, yes. And they're like, if they kill all of the Pikmin... Then you just fail the dungeon. And then I walk to the edge of the arena and throw a single bulb bin out of it. And I go, yeah, what now? <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to experiment. I'm scared. But he can't do anything to me. And when you take him down, and he is a joke, and moving with his bubble buddy ass moving all around, freaking flubber ass animations, I can't imagine playing this as a child. It's I cannot imagine the catharsis. Best payoffs for such a terrifying boss fight. Like, you don't suddenly deal with Nemesis. Okay, his legs are gone now. He's just a torso hobbling after you. Mm-hmm. And I'm exposition. like, this is what Pikmin is at its best. Pikmin is a constant struggle against time, against fear, against keeping a cool head. The best moment of Pikmin 1 was when I accidentally woke up that egg. When I went, I'm not touching that egg, and it woke up anyway. And I'm like, who are you? Why are you in my house? Go away. You're killing my boys. Look how he massacred my boys. That was the best moment that I had in Pikmin 1. And that was an entire dungeon constructed in Pikmin 2. And that's, that's a huge hats off moment for that. Absolutely fantastic. I love that sense of discovery. I love that sense of figuring out the rules of the world. That is by far the strongest moment of Pikmin 2 for me. I would completely agree. Now, anyone who goes Erm actually trying to defend their point is wrong. If you think it's even close to a spoiler, it's a spoiler. No, uh, yeah, some... How mean do I want to be? Some people have a very hard time looking at things outside of their own perspective. Like, no, 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 some people are like, I, I, know I want to see you... No, I want to see you play the game how I played it. I want to see you have the same memories of this game that I had. Mm -hmm. I want to feel the game again through you. 
And I know people are looking for that, which is why it's so much fun performing. Which is why it's so much fun going, oh god! Okay, 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 okay. Because you're just taking that natural emotion and letting it out in its fullest form. Yes. And it's great. It serves it well. At the same time, you have to understand, I'm not going to be you. You have to understand that with any streamer. They're not going to be you. They're not going to be your experience. With that said, I do think that streaming Pikmin has greatly improved my experience. Because I get to have those emotional reactions to the game in their fullest form. And that feels great. Absolutely. Backseat gaming, not even. It's just that feeling of, oh, I know what happens next. Look at where we are. It, yeah, building up the anticipation for something. So you know yeah. something's going to happen. Or that feeling of, what are you even doing? <laughs> Which was funny. Many people questioned my bread bug tactics. And after that, I would also question my bread bug tactics. To be fair, the bread bug tactics really aren't explained very well. No, <laughs> but I was happy to figure them out. It made me feel proud and smart and stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, just to say, I've been loving streaming. Like, let that not take away from anything else. This is just purely intellectual after the fact, reflecting on it. Um, ultimately, I do think that... I like the Pikmin series a lot. I hope that it has more moments like the Submerged Castle. Um, Don't spoil me. Not going to spoil you. I'm, I'm just thinking for myself. All right. It, Don't it, be my it, It'll be interesting seeing you play through the rest of the series. I'll, I'll be interested. I think I'm going to take a break after Pikmin 2, I just so I don't wise. burn out on the series. 3 is different. And just to figure out things. I'm, I'm sure it is. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it, but um, I do want to be able to branch out and do other things because I feel like when you're pigeonholed into one specific series for such a long time, that can be it creates problems when you go out of it. If you yeah. go out of it early, then you can come out, then you can come back. <sighs> but yeah, overall, my thoughts on the Pikmin games are very, very positive. Um. They were never going to hit exactly where I wanted them to because I was too much of a coward to appreciate them as a child if I played them in my childhood. And I'm too far removed from it now to have the same impact that it had on a lot of people. Mm. But I think they're great games. Nice. I really do. Just as a guesstimation, right. like top 150, top 200, where... Uh, nah, I'll freaking know. Like too, Pikmin too, one's too in the, Pikmin one is in the seven out of tens. Pikmin two has a chance to climb. Like eight out of ten minimum is getting into my top one hundred. Okay. And Pikmin two is at about the seven level. I don't know. If if anyone is bored, you can just look up Pyrrhic Kong on uh, Backlogged. I post reviews of every game that I beat. Um, after I beat them, there, so. If you're bored, that's there. And there is a full review of Pikmin on there. Very nice. Okay, and you had one more? Um, it, It's a game that I'm going to be playing this month, too. I think I'm going to save what I have for next month, just because we haven't been talking for two, <laughs> over two hours. Well, no, we've been talking for three. Oh, no, 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 that's two o'clock. I can't see. <laughs> that's, that's, that's okay. You scared me for a second, there, though. Ah, no, 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 okay. So, there is one game that I've been talking about for the past while, and um, obviously need to finish this thought, finish the story, so to speak. And that is Like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth. I beat it. You did. Every single sub-story, every single remembrance, only things I haven't done are darts, mahjong, Shogi, and a couple of the uh, Chinese-based gambling games. Mm -hmm. So, it is fair to say I have seen 99% of what the game has to offer. And I am going to ask you, how deep in spoilers do you want me to go? I'm not going to start launching out spoilers, but... Uh, go, go ahead. Like, I, it's a game right. I'd like to play at some point, but it's... 
that's not my life anymore. I can't handle a 100 hour RPG. Well, you can you can handle one of them. It wouldn't be because you're not going to play this one first. It'd be Baldur's Gate 3. Mm -hmm. All right. So my overall thoughts on the game are that it is the most Yakuza Yakuza game that any Yakuza game has ever been. It is pumped up to 11. Um, how I'm going to go about this is give general thoughts, then give thoughts on the sections where you have control of Kiryu, and then talk about the end game. Okay. So, I think that this is a dramatic improvement gameplay-wise from the first Like a Dragon game. Just in general, movement is improved, battle systems are improved. I, I would even say the mini games are improved. Like there's such a joy. Side quests pull probably about even. They are incredibly hilarious. I would say that the first Like a Dragon. The uh, Ichiban game is a bit more consistent, but this game has Baby Man Let It Snow. And, like, that is a peak. Indeed. Um, this was an incredible experience. Absolutely insane. For 120 hours. And the last five don't stick the landing. No. Oh, but after everything you saw, oh. it is they are ite. All right, that that's oh. I was like, this could be one of the greatest games I've ever played, if it sticks the landing. Now it is merely in my top one hundred. <laughs> How dare it! How dare it indeed. It's, it's, I'm not even upset at the ending. The issue is that the previous two games were two of the best endings to video games I've ever seen. Mm. And this one merely being all right, but having some clear glaring issues creates an unfortunate disconnect. Yeah, an 8 out of 10 sticks out a lot more if the other two were... 12 out of 10s. Mm -hmm. But un understand, like, everyone, I'm saying that this is some of the best 120 hours up to that point that I've ever played. So, y you gotta understand where I'm coming from. No, yeah, I, I, I get you, I get you. All right. So last time I left off, I had just unlocked the Kiryu sections. This is the biggest celebration of the series possible. Because across the map of Iskai Jincho, which was Ichiban's stomping ground from the first game, mm -hmm. are different little puddles of remembrances. And you go up to one, and Kiryu will look at something in the city and go, huh, this reminds me of this time. And he will have a small flashback to events from a previous game, and he'll detail his thoughts on how time has changed him since his time. He is going over the entirety of Yakuza moment by moment from things as dramatic as friends dying to things as benign as I remember when I fought a giant squid. That was crazy. <laughs> to, to things like, oh, that looks like a castle. I remember when I had a dream when I was Miyamoto Musashi flashing back to the non-canon Ishin game. <laughs> Is like, it was so odd. It felt so real. <gasps> this series loves the Yakuza series. Or this game loves the Yakuza series, rather. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the agonizing bit where Kiryu's friend Date comes. And he's like, hey, Kiryu, how you doing? Because he's one of the only people that knows he's alive. And he sets up moments where he will invite one of Kiryu's old friends to a bar and he will talk to them while Kiryu has to just stay in the background hidden oh, and listen to what they no, think oh. of him and Date is actively asking him well c come on dude come on you're dying you have cancer what are they gonna do to you 
because Kiryu is refusing to take treatment for his cancer because he doesn't want to show weakness in the end and he still feels like he has a duty to other people. So Date is bringing people back into his life so he, they can tell him what they meant to him so that he feels the need to take care of himself for once. Oh. And he starts with one of the kids at the orphanage who is now 20 oh, and is no. having his first break. And he... And the kid is like, oh, damn, hostess clubs are great. Thank you, Date-san. And then a guy starts harassing the hostesses, and Kiryu's about to step in, but the kid from the orphanage steps up. Because yes. Uncle Kaz would have stepped up and protected women. And he gets his clock cleaned. And then Kiryu has to save him. So he has... This blurry vision of Kiryu having saved him at his lowest moment. And he wakes up and goes, Uncle Kaz. And Date's like, huh. yeah, you were screaming that all the time. When you took care of those punks on yourself, you must oh. really think about him, huh? Oh, my God. It's just like 15 scenes of that. Right down to the people who mean the most to him. And being like, what about your daughter? This is a spoiler. He can't bring himself to see his daughter. He gets to the bar where she's at. He's about to turn the knob. She's talking with his old friend who has found him out. And she's like, if I could see him again, I mean, that, that would be great, but... I, I can't rely on him forever. Like, he left me with so much. He left me with so much strength. And I think he would want me to walk forward into the future. And Kiryu leaves. He's right there. Ah. That's really fucking wholesome. This game fucking sucks. <laughs> It is, like, the amount that you will get out of this game is multiplied tenfold for every previous game you have played. Ah. It's hard. It's hard to say that this isn't one of the best games. Well, yeah, because now I'm wondering how... what happens. Okay, um, this is now spoilers for the ending of Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth. I will be going over the entirety of the final story sequences. So at some point, they've split the parties into two, right? Kiryu is in Japan, and Ichiban is in Hawaii. And they have a moment where they have to come together, and it's this fantastically wholesome moment where Kiryu is essentially passing the torch and Ichiban is going, okay, I can do this, but I need you to tell me something. Don't die. If the chance comes for you to save everyone, but you have to save yourself or you have to sacrifice yourself, you find a way for you to live. You promise me that or I won't go. And he goes, Okay, I can do that for you. And then Ichiban goes, great. Um, by the way, I didn't know that you proposed to a girl. And Kira's like, yeah. No, I got game. <laughs> Ichiban's like, C can you tell me how you did it? Just, 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 just for some tips. And he's like, <laughs> uh, I just looked her in the eyes and said I loved you. And Ichiban stares at him and goes, Oh! Oh, I screwed up! Oh, I fucked it up so bad! Oh my god! And it's so funny! And it's so good! That's so amazing. anyway, um, the final boss in Japan is the final remnants of the Yakuza. They have been 
throwing Kiryu's name under the bus, using secret VTubers to pin crimes on Yakuza's to make sure that they are unable to, which has ruined the lives of some of Ichiban's friends and Ichiban. This man, who is leading the effort, hates all Yakuza, wants them to suffer and fade into a miserable irrelevancy. He is also Ichiban's half-brother. Okay. He was born to another person who Ichiban's father was promised to. And so Ichiban's father had to create an heir for that sense instead of with the woman he loved. And Ichiban is the child of love as opposed to the child of duty to the Yakuza. Mm -hmm. And this guy hates that. And he's voiced by a celebrity. And he describes himself as Ichiban's dark mirror. And he is Kiryu's final boss. But... Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. So we're, so we're going Jon Snow and the Night King here, I'm seeing. Uh-huh. Huh. And when Kiryu makes his heartfelt thing to please start believing in people to this person who is a perfect foil for Ichiban, it falls so flat. Well, that sucks. Meanwhile, Ichiban is in Hawaii, and let me explain to you the progression of his boss fights. Okay. First, he has to fight Danny Trejo, who has two machetes. Perfect. He is shirtless on a boat. He can't... Then he has to fight a giant shark that is the size of the boat. D this is... This is... The Yakuza. giant shark ate Danny Trejo because Danny Trejo was too cocky. Then he goes to Cultist Island and has to fight an army of cultists while avoiding landmines. There are 200 cultists, but some of them are good, but they lock him in a building and he has to escape the burning building. Imagine just fighting thousands of brainwashed people. Whilst all in Hawaii, everyone has been hunting you down for your entire existence there because they are also secret brainwashed cultists. As you'd expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He gets to the area where the secret nuclear waste disposal facility is because in the 11th hour, the game becomes about Japan's nuclear waste issue. Okay, okay. However, he has to fight the guardian of the island when the people lock him in a secret underground lair and the Kraken shows up. <laughs> sure. So then you fight the Kraken, who has two tentacles as separate targets with their own health bars. Like it's a fucking Paper Mario blooper boss. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, after fighting Danny Trejo, a giant shark, Cultist Island, and the Kraken, you are faced with your ultimate foe. A 111-year-old man with two SMGs. Bit of a downgrade, but I can see that being fun. Who is an excellent final boss representing the old age clinging on for cure you is this intentionally juxtaposed no it's just no it's just weird that they created two perfect narrative through lines and then chose the wrong ones so that cure you could fight a guy on top of a tower just really wanted that metal gear solid 4 Four reference? Is that four? No, because Kiryu fights a guy at the top of a tower every time. Oh, well. <laughs> you couldn't fight a guy with two SMGs on top of a tower? No, because he's Hawaiian. Fight on top of a volcano. Volcanoes That's not the same as Millennium Tower, dude. It has to be Millennium Tower. Do you know how many people have fallen off that tower and lived? At least six. Probably. I don't know. <laughs> so you get 
the odd ending where the message of the game is diluted because the characters don't really work off of the right foils. And the best moment of the game, of the endings, is given to Ichiban's friend Chitose, who decides to use VTubers for good. <laughs> Impossible. And goes... He, because the old man is like, I control all of Hawaii. All of the governments follow me. What are you going to do? And she just pulls out her phone and goes, there's Wi-Fi here, idiot. Hey, folks. <laughs> wow. Would you look at all of that? Is this improperly disposed of nuclear waste? Wow. And then Ichiban has this beautiful, beautiful, incredible moment where one of the villains has gotten away, but he's been exposed as a fraud online, just like Ichiban was, but for real, for real. Mm -hmm. And he is basically holed up in a building as people are harassing him and basically ready to end himself. And Ichiban walks in and he's like, oh, this is where you are. He's like, how did you find me? You're an idiot. He's like, yeah. But I have friends, and I love my friends, and you're my friend. And he's like, Ichiba, I've tried to kill you multiple times. I have betrayed you. I did it with a smile. And, he, and Ichiba's like, yeah, but when we met, we had some good times, and we can't erase those smiles either. So you know what? Turn yourself in, and I promise you, I, it's going to suck. It's going to be awful. And there's days where you're going to doubt yourself, but that's the only time that you can truly heal. And I am going to be there the day you get out. You tell me, man, I will be there for you. And we'll go and get drinks. Oh. And Ichiban carries him to the police station on his back because his legs are kind of screwed up. So that while people are throwing garbage at Ichiban for doing this, because his image hasn't recovered, mm -hmm. another influencer comes up and films himself harassing Ichiban and punches Ichiban in the face, and Ichiban just takes it and smiles at him. And the crowd slowly dissipates and leaves. And Ichiban drops him off, and he's like, I can take it from here. You'll really be here? Yeah, man. That's what friends are for. Oh. And it's so good. And it's unearned. <laughs> this game is so good, but the pacing is so fucked at the end. That's that's such a goddamn shame. Cuz it cuz it sounds like the conclusion that you're wanting was just there. It is. It's right there! All they had to do was swap two guys! It's not even so bad, it's just... Eh. When it could... But the expectation is for it to be the best thing it could possibly be. Oh yeah, I, I, I totally get where you're coming from. There's so many things I've experienced. I'm like, oh yeah, that was good. But I can clearly see a direction they should have, they could have taken, that they should have taken, mm -hmm. that would just make it one of my favorite things ever. And you just, why, why no? Is it, is it the setup for like, I don't know, sequel baits? They have to I, be in the certain situations? I don't know. No, no, because the game ends and it ends with Kiryu saying he's taking chemo now. And he says, what's your name? And he goes, Kazuma Kiryu. And it gives you a trophy that says the man who reclaimed his name that it's like nice hey, that's so good that's so yeah. good you could have gotten to that anyway because that would have you didn't so need to go down this path it's throwing away how things used to be against that one smg dude that would have that yeah. would have punched that would have hit maybe the writers just got really drunk at one point and just a couple of pages got swapped 
and that just went all the way through production like that. Yeah, but, like, then they made this one villain who's just unique to this game, and Yamai is so hot, and he's got such a good story, and he's so hot. I wanted this to be one of the best games ever. I really did. My God. Like a Dragon 1 ends so incredibly. Like I have never had so many emotions and all of them suck in the worst ways of being so good. Like you ever have that feeling of like, fuck, you got me. You mm. got me so good. I was completely there, and then you punched me in the face. But it was earned. Oh. So ultimately, I, I have to say, I liked the first game more, but it's going to be hard to go back to it. It's, that's interesting, because the plot points hit stronger, but the evolutions but, they made for this game yes, are just crazy. Exactly. Yeah, I, I feel like yeah. And like, I'm gonna have to buy the next game. <laughs> Gotta see what like, happens. Like, no, Sean, this is insane consistency. Like, there are three nine out of ten games in here stapled together. With a few ten out of tens. And then the ending is just deflating. Hmm. Well, uh, th th this is the second Like a Dragon game, right? The this second kind of Ichiban styles. game, yeah. So yeah. maybe it's been set up as a trilogy? Oh, I, I assume they're just going to run Ichiban stories until they can't. Okay. So maybe, it, maybe it's a transitionary point for a stronger payoff at the end. Well, well it, it, it very clearly is, but they could have had such a strong payoff. No, yeah, I, I agree from what you've described. It's like, God, Kakiryu's not going to be the best character this year by default. I mean, I have, I've... He's going to have to actually work. Will he, though? I haven't... I haven't seen much of anything from any other game this year, narratively. I, uh, Barrett exists. Oh, shit, right! Never mind, I forgot Rebirth. Yeah. Okay, no, like, there's, okay, there's like three. Bring Kate, Kate yeah. is right there. That, that, okay, so Rebirth. Yeah, Rebirth and Yakuza are going to be fighting each other to the death. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to look at the last minute and be like, did Reload add anything story wise? <laughs> but yeah, um,. This is an incredible game. It is like a 9.5 out of 10 for the entire runtime until it dips into being a narrative disappointment. Damn. But only a mild narrative disappointment. But also, it was, it was riding so high that that's a bigger fall than most. Mm-hmm. God. I wish you had any experience with the series. I'm sorry. I know. I wish I could add more. Like, thank you for letting me go off because I have no one else to go off with. But God. For what it's worth, I have immensely enjoyed experiencing this series vicariously through you. Well, thank you. I do appreciate that. Ah, I'm just mad. I, I think you're justified in feeling that. It was right there. Ichiban had sex and Aloe Happy watched. Uh, you good with the Yakuza? Can we move on to the... <laughs> yes, 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 we can move on. 
Transition. Future Sight. Will I ever update that thing? Probably not. I oh, never unlikely. remember until I watch it again. Alrighty, so here's the news from the past month that I collected with my brain. Huzzah! Um, so, uh, you know about NPCs, right? I'm, I'm, I'm fairly aware. Non-player characters. Um, have you ever wished that, like, instead of being written, uh, they could just talk to you and say whatever they wanted? I know what you wish that you had to. an experience more personalized to your exact taste and search metrics so that your games could have an infinite number of stories inside of them. Well, I, the, the only reason I'm pausing is because I want NPCs to react to the dumb shit that you do in video games. But that's not where this is going. No, not at all, because Ubisoft has you covered here because they're presenting their new research project, Neo NPCs, using generative AI to really talk to you. Yes, with the biggest of quotation marks around really. God, Stormgate just did this as well. It's not there, guys. It's really not. It, even if it was there, I wouldn't want it. Because telling a constructed story matters that much more to me. I don't want to have a different experience from the person next to me. I want to be able to talk about that experience. Mm -hmm. If Ichiban didn't fight the giant squid, but instead fought a giant bear in their game, that wouldn't be as good. I, I remember seeing the president of Larian talking about this, where this could be useful. I, I think the example... No, uh, that's not... But, yeah. but, like, having a character react to you wearing a pot on your head, that kind of region, he thought might be interesting, but this is re replacing kind of storytelling altogether, and that doesn't work. Yes, I entirely agree with uh, that assessment. I... As with most things, I think that AI is at a point where it can be used as a smoother, as a buffer, yeah. as the ability to help things along. It cannot be used as a replacement. And unfortunately, we're going balls deep into the ability of it being a replacement, because that's very easy to do. Mm -hmm. it's, very, it's very cost effective to not have to hire people to write a game. Well, no, because then you don't make money as much money from the game. But we haven't seen the back of our flash from that yet. No, we haven't gotten there yet. Who knows? No, oh, yeah, man. Maybe yeah, exactly. it gets better enough, quickly enough. Mm -hmm. But... I mean, we got, we've, we've seen games that had people write them and haven't done well from not investing in the right people. I cannot see AI. That's... I don't know. It's, it's something that I want to see advance properly regulated, because yes. I do see there is some good, some strength, but to everyone who is now saying that pencil is a bad word, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> oh, damn, your eyes look like fully out of your head right there. I, I love just that kind of internet person. That just goes around with like a whack-a-mole mallet. It's just like, no, no, that's, that's, no. No, I'm taking a stand. I'm making a difference. Fighting for the right thing by retreating from any conflict. <sighs> yeah. Oh, no. I'm nervous. Life sucks. Weird, boring dystopia. Yeah, I love it. But you want to know who else lives in a weird dystopia that is less boring? Ah, uh, I, I think he, I think he's doing okay. Yeah. You might ask yeah, no, it's the, the residents of Southtown because Fatal Fury: City of the Wharves is now more than just pictures of the wharves. Of the wharves. <laughs> you know, this is a famous sequel to the game Garou: Mark of the Wharves. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, this is the first time we have an actually English Terry Bogard who isn't, hey, hey, are you okay? Honestly, he has an actual voice. I don't like it as much, but it, I, I get it. I don't, but I respect the moxie. <laughs> um, this just looks like a fighting game, and it looks good. I love how heavy the shadows are. Yes. It's not quite Borderlands levels, but it's still so stylized. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm just excited to see it. Grow is such a stylish game, and this is actually taking its style, the grungy little Fail Fury style, and putting it out there in the front. It's working well. It's taking concepts from Grow 2. We actually have Joe Higashi's protege in the game. Mm -hmm. That's just cool. Eventually, the game is obviously going to have the cute pirate girl that I like, and then I can play the game. Nice. I am curious about how big this game is going to be, because this year's has been away for a while, right? Oh, yes. No, last game was like, oh gosh, late 90s, early 2000s. Yep, yep. So. But no, it, uh, it seems just crunchy. I know that... Uh, Max and Justin Wong had hands-on with it. Oh my god, did did you see that one video of Justin Wong on that's going making the rounds? I don't think so, but tell me. Um, so he's playing Chun Li against Ken online mm -hmm. in uh, Street Fighter Third Strike with a uh, rollback netcode, mm -hmm. and he's doing his super. And his opponent is parrying him perfectly. <laughs> and he's going, no, no, no. And then they drop it and KO flashes on the screen for one second. And then the rollback rolls back in and reveals, nah, they got that. And he loses. <laughs> the universe has conspired against Justin Wong to make this happen every single time. <laughs> I'm trying to look it up right now. Oh my god. Where? Where? I must Where know. I'm oh god. Who did I share it with last? Uh, uh, hang on, hang on. Hold up, hold up. Let me cook, let me cook. Please, please. This is this is a necessity. I think I found Almost it. Almost. Okay. This is three minutes long. No, it, sh it should be shorter. Uh, hang on, let me... I, I, I found it. Okay, good, 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 good. Ah, uh, no, that's not it. That no, no, wait. I... I got I got I got it here. You got it? Fantastic. Yeah, um... yeah, 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 right there, right there. Uh, boop. 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 I'll play the audio for that. So intense. What? No, come on. Are you serious? The game. Yo, why the game? The game? The game? No, the games that I won. The game. The game. The game. Uh, oh, that my God. Me happy. Thank you for sharing that. That man has the most patience of any man in the world. He's been suffering for that for two decades. And he's, and he's so fast. good at fighting games. This is oh. a Crystal Crown Hawk Day. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Alrighty. But then, moving on, um, do you want to know who else is in their personal Groundhog Day? <laughs> that that that's a good pull for that one. Is it Pokemon? Uh, that, perhaps. That's right. It's anyone who works on fan games with Nintendo and specifically Pokemon fans. Uh, there was recently an interview with uh, Luke Plunkett with a lawyer from Nintendo uh, who has done um, you know, lawyer stuff specifically for things that would involve like cease and desist. Mostly uh, focusing on like Detective Pikachu and his job and what he did. But it ends with this specific quote. Um, 
I'm just going to go, this is Luke here, um, from Aftermath. Before we wrap up, as a games journalist who has covered the scene extensively, there is something I've always wondered and never got the chance to ask. How does the Pokemon company handle cease and desist letters with regards to fan projects? How did you find them? And where did you draw the line on what's allowed and what the company thinks needs to be shut down? This response? Short answer? Thanks to you folks. I would be sitting in my office minding my own business when someone from the company would send me a link to a news article, or I would stumble upon it myself. I teach entertainment law at the University of Washington and say this to my students. The worst thing on earth is when your fan project gets press, because now I know about you. Oh. Oh no. Yeah, that's how that works. So, yeah, um... Every time anyone has ever said, Kotaku, please shut the fuck up. Shut up. Shut up. No, it was true. I mean, it was true before that, but now it's well, no, like no, no, it, ramifications. Yeah, but like... There it is, clear as day. The worst thing you can do is talk about a fan project. This is just really funny to me. No, it, it's absolutely hilarious. It's, it's, it's just kind there. of sad, but also hilarious. Absolutely. Oh, man. But you know what's also kind of sad, but also hilarious, and also related to Pokemon? I love I can now, like, track where you're going on the document now with this. Because, like, there is that one fan... Not fan game, but... <laughs> the game that is most prevalent to that sort of discussion that they can't quite get their hands on. Yeah, exactly. But no, in this case, it's Pal World. Um, and the Pal World devs are in a little bit of a panic. And, uh, you know... That could be for a variety of reasons, but for this specific reason, it's because they are making too much money. Their Pal World has made too much money, and they have no idea what to do with it. Which is just the worst problem to have in this It's, it's day such a small age. company. There's so much money. We don't know how to divvy it up. It is overwhelming, the response to Pal World. Our company is not infrastructurally able to handle this. Uh, what a what a bizarre story of a game. Now let's look at the rest of the games industry <laughs> and see how it's doing. And now let's look at Pal World. Everything's on fire, but hey, I'm a fire elemental. This is actually great. God. It's just everything else is exploding to a point that it's created enough pressure that's fusing into its own star. And that star yeah. is Pal World. The new mascot. Pal World is just sitting there to be like, success. well, we tried burying it, shredding it, and burning it. But then we just decided to give it all away. <laughs> Gosh, I... That's, that's, I don't have much to add to that. That's just hilarious. I don't either. Like, Pal World has gone kind of quiet in the past while for news stories. That doesn't mean it's dead. No, it's like, it is going so numbers. silently, hilariously strongly. <sighs> anyway, next story. Mm-hmm. Uh, transitions didn't work. Um, so <laughs> let's just go with the fact that um, I could actually play this game now. I could actually play Guilty Gear Strive because they added ABBA to Guilty Gear Strive right. on March 26th. Uh, this is a character who ha wasn't in Exerd at all. And this, this is the key girl. Mm -hmm. This is She has a giant key and she's like, I love key. Key is my husband. And the key is like, I, uh, I I get off on bloodlust sometimes, but girl, uh, uh, I'm like, wow! I love everything that this character is about. 
What's his name? Patrocles? Patro it starts with a P. Uh, Paracelsus. Paracelsus. There we go. And she comes with that. the best song. Symphony oh, no. is such a good song. Wow. A Guilty Gear character comes out with the best song. Yeah. Fucker. It keeps happening. But Symphony is really good. No, it's phenomenal. Like, I don't play Guilty Gear, but I follow character updates religiously because it just adds <laughs> one more song to my work playlist. I'm like, I just want to feel upbeat, energetic, and just... Yep. Uh <laughs> Apparently, her gameplay style is like she is the worst character at everything, and then she gets jealous that you touched Paracelsus, and then she becomes the best character. <laughs> like, her concept is jealousy incarnate, and then she becomes insane. Like, she goes from worst character in the game to broken. And, like, we've had versions of this before, but this is one that, like, flips a switch. This is going from zero drinks Jamie to eight drinks Jamie. <laughs> oh, that's, that's so fun. And I'm assuming it's a lot easier to get than four drinks Jamie is. Oh, I'm assuming so, yes. Like... Not a lot of characters will make me go, oh, maybe I'll try out this game. And it's just like, oh, shit. Oh, damn. Oh, her, though. Her. No, yeah. She's so unstable. And I can fix it. No, I can't. But I she can, can make me it. worse. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> there is a key in the way, and I can't touch it. <laughs> uh... Also, didn't they announce season four too? They just keep going. Oh yeah, no, no, no. They announced it, and they gave the various obvious trailer of, "Look, here are bats with a red outline. Who could he be?" It would be so funny if it was somebody else, but it's Slayer. Yes, and he will also get me to pick up that game. It's, uh, honestly, from what I know of Slayer, he might get me to pick up the game too. At the very He's least, really fun. Another. Best theme from a new Guilty Gear character, because Slayers is going to be amazing. You already know. Exactly. I love Guilty Gear. <sighs> I don't play it, but I love Guilty Gear. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, same, same. And speaking of love but don't play, um, fans of Final Fantasy XIV. Yes, this story. Oh, this story. <laughs> have been greeted. So... The next expansion to FF14 is coming out this July. It was it, just announced. And they're like, why did you sell on this release date, Yoshi P? And he goes and he puts the mic to his mouth and he goes, Elden Ring? <laughs> and the audience laughs and starts <laughs> applauding. And so he explains that, well, personally, I thought the Elden Ring DLC we were is coming out. And... Um, you know, a lot of people out there who play FF14, and also my team, would really like to play it. <laughs> you get one week. That's, that, that's, in all these stories of how much the game industry sucks, that's like peak games industry right there. Yes. Oh my god. It's just people who love video games are like, yo, video games though. We'll give you some time because we want to play this one too. No one is going to be on staff to manage an entire new expansion when <laughs> Elden Ring is out. <laughs> We're going to be sitting there and like, okay, who's working on the game? Okay, keep your hand up if that was a lie and you're playing Elden Ring. Okay, great. Same. <laughs> uh, there's, not, there's not really much anything else to that story. It's just a feel-good nicety. No, I know. Like, I love when there's, like, old stories of, like, this guy who used to work at uh, Argonaut Software when they were working on Nintendo for uh, Star Fox and Star Fox 2 were like, yeah, 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 we were um, having a good time. But the issue was that uh, the PlayStation came out and Ridge Racer came out mm -hmm. and everyone really loved Ridge Racer, but we were Nintendo, so we couldn't say it. <laughs> but, like, it was a problem. We had to take Ridge Racer away. <laughs> No, yeah, that 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 sounds about. <laughs> it's, 
so good. Yeah. But uh, speaking about companies not making video games. Hey, now, they made the best one of last year. I take umbrage hey, for hey. that. It's for good reason. I didn't say that it was for bad reasons. I was saying for good reasons. For Elden Ring? For Ridge Racer? Um, we are talking about Larian Studio because they are not making Baldur's Gate 4. They are not making any further DLC for Baldur's Gate 3, and they will not be working with Wizards of the Coast again. Please stop asking. Yeah, no, I'm sure. But he hearing them explain it, it makes complete sense because they wanted to innovate further on the gameplay formula they've created, and you can't really do that when you're designing in the constraints of an established tabletop game. Well, no, they can't do that because they had an excellent relationship with Wizards of the Coast. And then every single person that they were working with with Wizards of the Coast on BG3 was laid off during Wizards' section of layoffs. Oh, I didn't hear that side. Of oh. No, you, you can tell that there is a point in Larian's thing where like, yeah, no, it's been great working with this license. It's been fantastic. And then after the game's release, they're like, yeah, Baldur's Gate 3. And they just stop talking about Wizards. <laughs> Honestly, even if it wasn't the problem, I'm so glad that they're doing that. Cause yeah, likewise. I no, Larian remains, like, as the kids would say, the most based company. Just straight up, and I can't wait to see what they can do now. Because I know they're not making Divinity 3 either. They've outright said that, which means they're doing something entirely new. And that's exciting to me. For a developer that's been this like well-led and constructed and like actually keeping the employees mm -hmm. that made the good yes. games novel concept yes. i know but to actually take all that and be like okay now let's see what else we can do there's there's so like sky's literally the limit for what they could do next mm -hmm. <sighs> also, but you know it's just been so fun to see sven do a victory lap and just rag on every nasty thing you know, like every tradition happening in the games industry it's been like oh yes us? oh you're overpricing for microtransactions we didn't need to do that look at all these awards i literally can't hold all of these awards can you imagine not being owned by a publicly traded company <laughs> it's it's such a crazy dream and yet i'm living it mm -hmm. yeah. oh god who could ever not be beholden to the whims of stockholders hmm just one of the best people in the industry right now. I love Sven. Absolutely. But you know who probably is beholden to the stockholders and making as much money as possible? Everybody else. Well, not 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 making as much money as possible. No, 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 no. There's some scam in here. Okay, okay. Well, because we got right in here Tekken 8. Oh. Oh, they they did they did the Street Fighter of way too much money. Oh no 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 no! They did it worse. They did it worse. Oh, it's a one no. The Street Fighter was just microtransactions. Street Fighter was just you want a twenty dollar Ninja Turtles outfit. What do you mean? Twenty dollar per Ninja Turtle. And Mortal Kombat was like, hey, do you want a ten dollar fatality? Tekken Eight was like. Battle Pass. And they're like, clearly, you know, obviously, we wouldn't withhold things that would be expected in the base game from the Battle Pass, except for multiple costume pieces from Tekken 7 are behind this Battle Pass. And of course, this Battle Pass, you, you don't need money to do it. You just need 600 Tekken coins. Mm, oh, of course. Yeah. Would you care to guess what increment you can buy Tekken coins in? Oh, God, it's going to be something absurd. That's right. Only 500 coin increments. Of course. Of course. Why would it be convenient like that? Freaking Chuck E. Cheese tickets logic right here. <laughs> uh doesn't it have a season pass already? What? I'm pretty sure Tekken has a season pass too. Yeah, but this is this is a battle pass now. Now you can go live the Tekken lifestyle. Live the Tekken grind set. 
for that extra thing, incentive that fighting game players needed to stick with a fighting game. Because the thing is, like, I feel like that format works if the game's, like, free to play. Like, Battle Pass is constantly grinding for more. That 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 meshes well with the kind of grind set of fighting games. Well, but evidently not, because Multiverses everything. had to not exist for a year. Well, yeah, that's because Multiverses was a disaster out of the gate, though. That's... Yeah, but we said that we liked it out of the gate. Yeah, but they didn't. They clearly didn't know how to support a live service game. Oh yeah, no, no, no. They screwed it badly. But like everyone was gonna. It's uh it's the post release thing that really gets my goat. Mm -hmm. That's just punishing adopters. Just buying something and realizing, oh, we bought a a, a little less than what we expected. Numbers aren't adding up on our end of the month finance chart. Mm. Well, because you're saying there, and it's very clearly the plan. Like, look, I'll praise Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled all day. Adore that game. The fact that it added micros um, a month after release, scummy as hell. Mm -hmm. For a kid's game, especially. Cam's pointing out that the team working on A didn't want it. Like, that that's always the case. That's literally well, yeah, yeah, always yeah. the case. Can you imagine a team going, you know what, if we nickel and dimed all of our players, that would be the best thing? It's just the finance bros and the upper management. Like, the guy who is putting in Yoshimitsu's hitbox data or doing the animations on Azusena is not the same guy planning out the battle pass. It, you, you, it it just sucks. It's general trend. I hope it doesn't do well. It will, because they always do. Mm -hmm. But annoying. it could not do well enough. You have to consider that. That's also true. Numbers can always get higher. And that's when you look at how many employees are there and like, okay, how can we shave off a little few of these corners, make it fit through the square hole a little smoother? Yeah. Uh, also, people point out, yeah, it's a $70 game. Right! Ha! <laughs> uh. Is it even, though? Like, I've seen it. It's, it's, it's better than Tekken... Seven, but like, is it that much though? What was eight through sixteen or something? Yeah. Whew. But in any case, you know what else is a constant disappointment? <laughs> That's right. It's the International House of Pancakes. Oh. I mean, true. Yes, also true. No, 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 no. The other part of the story, I, I'm giving that guy some slack. He's fine. That's that's, that's fair, but yeah. But like, when's the last time you were like, damn, I had a really good meal from IHOP? I don't remember the last time I had a really good meal from IHOP. Because like, I feel like Denny's is the stoner of choice. The sort of 2 a.m. Why not? No, look, as someone who has been in an IHOP at 2 a.m., stoned out of my mind. The only thing going through my mind was I wish I was at Denny's instead. See, there you go. Can you imagine being that disadvantaged? However, they are trying to do something cool because they are offering a Sonic the Hedgehog themed menu. I do have to say Knuckles Sandwich, Dr. Eggman's Benedict. Like, oh, yes. This, this makes me really happy. <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm not tempted. <laughs> No, but, I know, wow. no, I am tempted. I want to say that I've eaten the Shadow of the Hedgehog pancakes. <laughs> oh, but don't worry, because even if you weren't tempted, Sega's got you covered because you can earn IHOP points for going here. And if you get enough IHOP points, you can unlock the exclusive Amy Rose, Amy Rose IHOP skin in Sonic Superstars. <laughs> You can make Amy Rose an IHOP waitress. I I see this, and all I want is that the what we talked about last time, the Sephiroth cloud thing with the udon noodles. Yes. I just want to see the Sonic the Hedgehog cast advertising these. I want to see 
I want to hear Travis Willingham talking about his knuckle sandwich he's about to get you. Prepared in under 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. With love. Uh, have I told my Sonic Denny story I on stream? I have never heard a Sonic Denny story in my life. Oh, boy. Let's freaking go. So, um, the first time I went to Denny's, um, I must have been like six. I didn't know any sort of quality with it. I think a friend was taking us there and suggested it or something. Mm -hmm. And they had a claw machine for Sonic Underground there. Okay. And there were figure there were uh, plushes of Sonic and Knuckles inside of them. And I look at that and I look at all the evidence of I have never seen a Sonic the Hedgehog before and conclude, ah, oh, yes, Sonic and Knuckles, the mascots of Denny's. <laughs> Years later, with me, the only thing I knew was that I had this Knuckles plush, and the only place I'd ever seen him was Denny's. And my friend comes over, and he brings his GameCube, and he has Sonic Adventure 2. And I look at this, and my mind is blown that Denny's could have such an amazing video game. <laughs> yes! That is exactly where I was hoping that was going. That's so good! So anyway, uh, yeah, this IHOP thing is a betrayal of everything I know and love. Oh, no, yeah! You can't... This is that whole what 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 was the fucking phone? The, can Home you stars? hear me now? Guy went over to Sprint instead. Oh oh yes. It's even worse. Sonic was supposed to rep represent something to mean something. Sold out. He 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 was supposed to be the Grand Slam. <laughs> God, when you saw that, then... <laughs> I'm the Grand Slam! Yes! <laughs> oh, it's it's all coming together, baby. I got this. Also, your, your camera's frozen in a very... Just... It's not frozen in my... It's not frozen in my end. Yeah, it's Weird. Hold on. Let me... Okay, hang on. I'll, I'll read it. I'll, I'll read up. No, no, I'll fix me. You can't, so I will. Just grinning endlessly. Oh wow, yeah, that is frozen. <laughs> your, your your eyes are perfectly level with the menu, so it just looks like you're really, really high. Like that knuckle sandwich is really tempting for you. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I'm I'm still rocking and rolling on my end. I'm disconnected <laughs> and reconnected. So can we make that an emote? If you make one, I'll I'll I'll, I'll try to implement it. <laughs> oh, they're easy to implement on YouTube. Go for it. Pure hunger. Hold on, let me... Hold on. Technical difficulties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pick, pick, pick me. Make uh, me nice. How do, how do I... I just close this. Pop up the player to another window. This is fine. To all the audio listeners out there, uh, my face is frozen on the stream in a very funny position. Uh-oh! Oh? This might be Discord itself. You oh. Can, you can still hear me properly, right? I can hear you and see you perfectly fine. It is functioning perfectly on my end. Everybody else can hear me, correct? Everybody in chat? What? Uh, I see Olimar now. Hello, Olimar. Yeah, hey, I put him up because I'm trying to mess with things. Okay. Discord is... crashing. Oh. Quickly. Oh, I see. Um... <laughs> I'm gonna... I'm going to close and reopen Discord, but Pierre's going to drop out for 20 seconds. I, I hope you all okay, survive great. while he's gone. One second. They won't. Okay, disconnect. Try to relaunch Discord. It crashed immediately when that happened. So everything's fine. How are you today? Good. I hope everybody's good. Trying again. Are you back? Discord crashed the second I left the call. Nope, you're still there. Oh, oh, there. And you're Hello? moving again. Huzzah. All right, there we go. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, I can't see you, though. Oh, dear. Uh... <laughs> Am I still on? 
No, yeah, I'm still on the stream. My green screen is dying. Oh, yeah, okay, you're on the stream, and I can't see you, so that's fun. <laughs> is, th is this... Does this work? Because I don't know what's happening. Fine. Yeah, let's, right, let's go. I just, can't, I just can't look at you for visual reaction anymore, and that's sad. I will try to passively fix it, but for now... What's the next story on the docket? Oh, it's simple. We're still fearing, feeling hungry. Anyone who wants the pure hunger emote, uh, this would be a good use of it. Because there's a secret. As you may have known, Dragon's Dogma 2 came out. And that game features the most succulent meat in the world. It has the best rendered meat. You would almost swear that it's real. And that's because it is. Oh, really? E Every time that you cook meat in that game, it is simply an MP4 of the actual team cooking meat. Oh, that's cheating. N no, it's not. Monster because Hunter the team... World managed to do the same, and they didn't have to do that. Cats yes, but the team meals. went out and said we could either spend the same amount of money rendering meat, or we could actually cook it and be able to eat it. That, you know what? That's fair. And like, I, I how could that. I argue with that? How how can I possibly? Give it, given the choice, I would do the same. I entirely agree. Look at that. Look at that. No, they yeah, had a I, good meal. I'm I'm hungry, just from the visuals alone. Also, I, my camera was off. Can you see me now? Yes, you're fine now. Perfect. Resolved. Yeah, God, I wish I could play Dungeons and Dragons ahead of time, but just nope. I got I got Monster Hunter Wilds in the future, and that's all Capcom's getting from me. My oh, damn. I really feel like Dragon's Dogma 2 is a you game, though. It so is, though! It's, it's so frustrating! Everything I see about it is... <sighs> Every time I see anything about DD2, I'm like, God, I could not like this game less, and Duke would really like it, probably. Yeah... I'm trying to. <laughs> Sorry, that cuts. What's the What's the next story? Oh yeah, next story. Um, moving on. So, um, just you know, we've been talking about a bunch of accessories, like with Amy Rose and with the Tekken characters and whatnot. But what if you want to take that out of the game? What if you want to accessorize not you, but your pet? I am one hundred percent down for what ever you were about to say. Well, fantastic. Because Square Enix is launching a new brand called S-Q-E-X-P-E-T-S. Which is just... That's right. Wow, what Your very happened. own apparel and anything else you need for your pet. We have a mini buster sword for your little dog. Dragon Quest bandanas. A Kate Sith inspired doghouse, a Sora hoodie for your dog. I love, I love that the Buster Sword has the chew rope at the end of it. So anytime the dog yes. is biting down on it, the whole sword's gonna be just like that one Dark Souls 3 boss. Yes, Kingdom Hearts themed dog beds. It's beautiful. It's amazing. I need scroll one down of to everything. the second post. There's more. There's more merch on more the second merch. post. Uh, it's, uh, 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 the uh, more products on display. I don't from have Twitter. I can't see. Oh, um, um. Can you send me a direct link? Does this one work? We shall see. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, look at oh, that. Look at that. Oh, it's just like a whole the big moogle with just going to his Yes, head. yes. Oh my All god. All words are escaping you. Oh, that's so good, though. How have more companies not done this before? I don't know. 
Square is really good at merchandising. Like, I'll, I'll give them that. Like, how do I'm I... sitting here, I got my freaking Pete action figure right behind my monitor, so, from Kingdom Hearts 2, so. Yeah, that, that's just the best thing I've seen all day. Lovely. Good. Good. And speaking of the best. The absolute best. The absolute best. Undoubted. This fucking story. When we look at this, we have a personal vested interest in this, given our end-of-the-year activities. Because, yeah. you see, BAFTA has put us in our place. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. through a survey of 4,000 people. Definitely 4,000 real people. What an incredible response of 4,000 people located primarily in the UK. They've determined the 20 greatest video game characters ever. And Duke, I got the list right here. I'm all set. I have a top 20 for you. Do you want me to give you the bottom 10 or do you want to go through and try to guess? I would love to try and guess. Okay. Because I um, I know, I unfortunately already know number one, so you're not going to get that reaction from me. So I'm, not, I'm going to skip over that altogether. Please say uh, Mario is at least number two. We'll get there. All right, so we have at number 20. Who, who are you thinking? Number, the 20 greatest video game character uh, of all 20. time. Tell me if you want a hint. Uh, let's, let's try it. Let's throw let's throw out a Kratos. I can see a Kratos 20. It is a Sony character. Uh, Joel? Nathan Drake. In, in like, 2015, maybe? Sure? Sure. Okay. All right, 19. Strong Who star. we got? It... Strong start. 19. I'll give you a hint. Another Sony character. No, this, okay, is this Kratos? No, this is Ellie. I, that that one I can I can understand, that one I can understand. Yeah, yeah, that is that is fair. Um, eighteen. This is from a Japanese video game series. Japanese video game series. Uh, okay, where would they put it? Eighteen. Uh, let's go. Cloud. I'll give you an additional hint. It'll be one that you'll actually be interested to hear us on this list. Barrett. Kazuma Kiryu. Oh hey, okay. It, but it, hold on, most iconic. Most iconic. Cosmic, yeah, definitely. You, de sure, sure. You put 17. that on a billboard. Somebody's definitely gonna know him. All right, yeah, keep throwing companies at me. Uh, it's from a it, European. European. I think I'm Ban pretty sure. Banjo. A Starian. The Look, 17th most iconic video game character is a star in from Baldur's Gate 3. I love Baldur's Gate 3. What the fuck? <laughs> who, who is the sample size? Is it Goldfish? No time. 16. Who you got? Uh, c c c company? Um, Japanese. Jap okay. Uh, it's Link. Cloud Strife. Okay, there's Cloud. Okay. Yeah, there's Cloud. 16. Yeah, okay, okay. Cloud, just just Cloud, top remember, top, top everyone top. above this is more iconic than Cloud Strife. I will remember that. <laughs> 15. Company? Night Dog. Wait. Uh, Crash? Crash Bandicoot, you got oh, it! Okay, okay, I, I can respect that. I can respect that. Alright, 14. Kunami. Not true, but I can respect it. Come on. Uh, Salt Snake. Salt Snake, you got it. Okay. Yeah, it's a, an argument to be had there, but I can see it over Cloud. Yeah, it is weird, but whatever, whatever. He's in more games. 13. Microsoft. Master Chief. Steve from Minecraft. Oh, okay. Well, that, that that's fair. 12. Nintendo. Fuck. Uh... I could... Link, then? Link? Pikachu. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Pikachu does not make the top ten. I... What? I'm sorry, but there are much more important characters, such as number 11 from a Rockstar game. 
I, what, I, that's what, what's this? Marston? Uh, I know the other one. Morgan. Uh, yes, Arthur Morgan. Morgan, okay. No. Yeah. Over Pikachu? No, Red Dead Redemption 2's protagonist who's only been in one game. Far more iconic than Pikachu or Solid <laughs> Snake. Uh, I, ah, okay. But that's okay, it's okay, we got number 10. Number 10, okay. What's the company? I'm not giving a hint for this one. Okay, okay, God, okay. I. Link's gotta be there. He's gotta be somewhere around here. Is, is your Link, guest Link? Is Link on the rest of this list? Link is somewhere in this list, I promise you. Uh, okay, okay, I'll go with Link then. Uh, no, actually, it's Shadowheart from Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> I... No time, number nine, Sony. Over Asterion 2? Yes. What metric is this? British. Number nine, come on, Sony. So, so uh, Kratos then. Kratos, yeah, you got it. Okay, okay, I, I knew he had to Look be here somewhere. You. Number eight, Microsoft. Master Chief. Banjo. No, I actually is Master Chief. <laughs> okay. It is Master Chief. I just wanted to see your face. Remember, British. <laughs> Number seven, Nintendo. I don't want to keep saying Link, but I feel like this has to be. Does it? This isn't Are Mario, you sure? is it? Give me a guess. This can't, no. no. Hang on, hang on. Samus. Link. Fucking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand this metric. Number six, old, old, really old. Oh. Pac-Man. Pac-Man. Yeah. Uh, okay. Fair. Solid. Yeah. Deserved. All right, and then this is the top five, the top five, five most iconic Without video game characters ever. Sure. I'm just going to say Nintendo or not Nintendo. Because I feel like you shouldn't need hints shouldn't. for the top five most iconic characters. Number five, not Nintendo. Not Nintendo. Okay, Sonic. Oh, you're you're close. It's it's actually a sack boy from Little Big Planet. No. What the fuck? <laughs> How? Uh, I'd like to point out. Donkey Kong is not on this list. I know that, based on how the rest of this has been going. Number four, not Nintendo. Fuck, can I... What metric is... The protagonist of Death Stranding. I don't know his name. No, too bad. It's actually Sonic. How could you not get that? I... I hate these people. <laughs> I hate them. Number three, I'll, I'll give it to you. It's not a Japanese dev. Master Chief hasn't been here yet, right? Master Chief was number eight. Ne oh, wait, no, number so this is a far shit. more iconic character than Master Chief. God. This is a character who is more iconic to video games than Sonic or Pac-Man or Sackboy. Can I ask if it's a shooter game? Yes. Is it Tracer? No, it's actually Agent 47 from Hitman. How could you not get that? <laughs> well, was the sample size old Square Enix shareholders? Number two, Nintendo. That's Mario. Don't yes, you yes, dare it say... Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. It's, <laughs> uh, it's actually Yoshi. <laughs> and then number one. I hate the that most I had iconic this video spoiled. game character of all time. It's fucking Laura Croft. You got it! Aw, oh, damn, you knew it! Laura Croft. I. I am flabbergasted. 4,000 players from around the world. But I. I. I, I, I can't figure out an angle to approach this from that this makes sense. Well, I can understand if it's geolocated primarily in the UK for Laura Croft. She has a huge following there. Like, that is 
an incredibly biased sample size. Uh, with that said, anyone she... not voting for Mario? Even yeah, like I could see her being high on the list based on the sample size, but number one. Number one. How? Like that for Agent Forty Seven back down. That is that also UK? Is that or is that what what I. Ah! The, 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 were these all, these all the rights that were... Wait, is this Embracer Group trying to punch the numbers of the brands they own? <laughs> no! Didn't they sell off it? I, I because they had... I know they sold off Deus Ex, but... And where does Sackboy come into this? <laughs> Sackboy threw me for a fucking loop, my guy. I'm so confused. I don't understand. Well, hey, y y you don't have to understand. You just can't be upset at how iconic Sackboy is. It's how, like, like, characters like Pac-Man, like Link, like Master Chief, like Solid Snake, they just don't, sh they just don't stack up. Don't even talk about friggin' losers like Crash Bandicoot or Cloud. I mean, they're they're not even in Shadow Hearts League. <laughs> I love reading through this and trying to see them spin. Like, yeah, yeah, Agent 47. Conceived by Danish video game developer. He's an icon in the gaming industry, captivating gamers worldwide. Number four, Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah. Oh my god. Hear you being on here makes me laugh, though. I... I... It's, it's Nintendo in wasn't such... as big in the UK. I get that for every character who isn't Mario. I... I... This hurts so much because it, it, it feels like a bit they're not committing to. It's perfectly spliced between... Oh yeah, I expect that. That makes sense. And just the weirdest... And to have it be so officially presented is, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not okay right now. Pikachu at number 12. How? Pikachu at number 12. Fucking two Baldur's Gate 3 characters? It's okay, Pikachu's just not as important Why as Arthur Nathan Morgan Drake or Why is Nathan Drake here still? <laughs> I'm so confused. You don't understand. He's from the famous game Uncharted. See, None Crash Bandicoot is in Nathan Drake's when game. Compared to the that rest of the list. Uh. <laughs> but you know who is the most iconic video game character of all? I don't fucking know anymore. Oh, that's right. Number zero, Hatsune Miku. You can't tell me the Vocaloid synthesizer isn't a video game. Yes, I They're can. They're like saying Mario Paint isn't a video game. <laughs> but it's okay, because Hatsune Miku is coming in hot to Crypt of the Necro Dancer. And it's actually a little fire. No, yeah, I, I honestly, I was, I was really surprised to see this, but that's actually really sick. No, that's a, it's a super good inclusion, and hearing her synthesized voice on top of Necro Dancer's beat works really well. Oh, oh my gosh! I haven't seen how she works gameplay wise. She like like passes through people in a chain, so if you line them up, you can do damage to all of them simultaneously. Yes. Oh, that's so cool, though. No, oh, she's, she's no, just she's checkers. actually rad. Yeah. She's just, that's so sick. Oh, that's so broken, too. But, God, that sounds like so much fun, though. I'm yeah, actually but Hatsune kinda... Miku should be broken in a rhythm game. I'm so down for She's this. She's so powerful. I'm actually, I am actually so down for this. Oh, shit. Um, my keyboard is freaking the fuck out. It's okay. We've, we've been talking for three and a half hours. Technical difficulties naturally happen. Yeah. Alrighty. Ah. But, you know... We've been talking about, you know, what's popular in the UK and whatnot, but we haven't really talked about what's popular in Japan. 
Yeah, Mario, because, Link, Pikachu. No. Well, yeah, 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 but you have to consider what could the most popular Xbox game be in Japan? Uh, you have to wonder. You, you do have to wonder, actually. I don't have an you answer do. for that. It did not do particularly well. God, Even with, like, Sakaguchi titles like Lost Odyssey on the 360. Yeah, I got nothing. Okay, well, actually, the answer is Metaphor Re Fantasio. What? Uh, you might know that as uh, the game that um, the Persona team is working on. You might also notice that the game isn't out. Which means oh. there are more test players oh. <laughs> for Metaphor Re Fantasio than there are individual players of any other Xbox game in Japan. Wow. This is from internal data. It just topped the list. That's so funny, though. This game doesn't have a beta. It's not been leaked. There is no demo. That's... That's so... In I, like, everyone knows that Xbox hasn't caught on there, but you, you really know when you see something like that. Oh my god. That's just the power of Persona. Is it the power of Persona, or the... It or is, the it makes you believe. Xbox? Everyone is going to their confidants and believing in them. They've maxed out the Xbox confidant. And now it is solely powering itself through their beliefs. They don't have to go back to it anymore. They just know. <laughs> and speaking of never going back. Unfortunately, we have lost uh, the 3DS and Wii U online services. Those closed within the past week. Yeah, may they rest in peace. However, we have achieved a very strong accomplishment which is that every single level in Super Mario Maker has been cleared by a human and has proof of it. And that's just kind of insane. That's amazing. There are some that were obviously cheated that humans could not defeat, but one of them was thought to be TAS only, and a human beat it anyway. There was an exception of, like, we beat all of them except this one. And then on the last week, right before the buzzer came in, some hero came in and beat it. That's that's just cool. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I'm watching it in motion, too. Just kicking the... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's the uh, level from... Uh, Sany X91SMM2. Memorable username. Yes. Oh, they're French. That makes sense. But yeah, cool. um, considering the sheer amount of creativity that went into Mario Maker, what a legacy that game has. Absolutely. That's like just kind of quietly swept under the rug. God, I remember where that was just everywhere. Yes. When that first came out. Absolutely. It's crazy that they haven't tried to do more things like that. Isn't it? But you know, as the year of Mario ends, as the year of Nintendo ends, something has to rise up in its place. Oh no. An opposing force has to rise. If you've seen everything coming in, you'll know what's coming. Sega has officially announced that this year, 2024, is the year of Shadow the Hedgehog. Sure. With, he, with the Sonic Generations remake, with Shadow being introduced in Superstars, with the Sonic 3 movie featuring Shadow the Hedgehog, this is the most Shadow content that will ever go into your eardrums and eye holes. And you will scream his classic line, I'm the coolest. Didn't he have, like, a whole game at one point that was made for him? He did, and there was some awesome music for it. This is true. All of me is a fantastic song. And just the entire soundtrack is really, I'm really good. That. But that's... Okay, sure, Sega. We'll... 
I'm curious to see if they triple down. Like, wouldn't it be so funny if Shadow the Hedgehog 2 gets released later? I on the I just want to s compare this to Luigi's gear. No, yeah, I know. Let's see all these comparison. <laughs> well, no, I just want to see which one comes out of it better. Because Shadow has a very low bar to clear. <laughs> like, it is a very safe bet to say that by this time next year, Shadow the Hedgehog will officially have outperformed Luigi in the only metric that matters. <laughs> I mean, like, let's not be that mean to Luigi. He, he tried. He tried, and he created the biggest financial loss in Nintendo history. Yeah, he, he tried. <laughs> All uh, Shadow has to do is not that. How long do you think he, it's going to be until... All he has to do is outperform... We are ru going out of the console market now. <laughs> yeah. How long do you think it's going to be until we see a year of that actually lives up to what that title suggests? Oh, it could be this year. Shadow the Hedgehog is... Like, he's going to give me everything that I expect out of Shadow the Hedgehog. Yeah, it'll, it'll certainly be. Or the older I get, the more I love Shadow. You know what? That's fair. I feel bad. He had an inverse curve of the coolest. Wait, I'm serious now. This is awful. What a waste of a character. <laughs> I'm the coolest. <laughs> that blue hedgehog again of all places. Hmm. Ah, oh, man. So it's kind of weird that, you know, we've had these two player two characters and they've gone their own years. Kind of weird that it happened twice. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if I had a nickel this year for every well-made 2D Prince of Persia game that came out this year, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Because the Rogue Prince of Persia, which will be developed by the Dead Cells dev, is entering early access in May. Which, okay, that's sick. Yeah. But also, huh? Yeah, no, it's, it's weird that this is getting focused, but like, quietly, like, Ubisoft is embarrassed that they're doing good Prince of Persia games. It wasn't even, like, in Captain Laserhawk or anything. No! But why is this such a... backwater brand for them? It looks sick. No. Yeah! I would expect something made by Dead Cells to be sick. Did they just do Castlevania? Yeah, they, there was an expansion for Castlevania, I think, was it a year ago? Two years? The, uh, la last sense. October, I want to say, yeah. But oh yeah, apparently this is what they're moving, the project they're moving forward to. Yeah, I I wish I had more of an investment with Prince of Persia. But also I don't, because it sounds miserable being a P.O.P. fan. <laughs> I mean, it, apparently it's getting better. Are you sure? I, I trust Dead Cells. I trust the Dead Cells developers. Okay. Okay, that's all the news stories I have. How did this episode end up the, just being the one? I talked about 15 games. That's how. You talked about, like, 40 last time. Yes, but I did those fast. This is true. Alright, well, uh, games coming out the last half of this month, I guess? I, Is there I, I guess. I... Nothing really caught my eye, to be dead honest with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to the right. Yeah, let me... Yeah, let me, let me take a bit look. Bit of a quiet year after the insanity of 2023. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I got, I got nothing on my end. Yeah, it looks like Dead Island 2. Oh, Sandland. That should be neat. That's the Toriyama vehicle combat game. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess there's Stellar Blade for fans of butts. Bayonetta spiritual successor? I don't know. 
No, it'd have to be good. I haven't seen combat at all. I've just seen butt of that game. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. What you working on? Yeah, it feels like feels like a slow time. Yeah, that's because it's the first fiscal quarter of the year. Everything came out in March. Mm-hmm. What I'm working on, um, if you're a patron of me, you can actually see right now the first seven minutes of the Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door video that I'm working on. That's available for all patrons. That should be releasing probably first or second week of May. That is nice and on schedule. That is where my focus will be. Um, Streaming-wise, I'm going to continue with Pikmin 2 until at least we rescue Louie. I'm debating doing 100%. I'm not sure. Uh, afterward, I will probably put up a poll in my community tab and we can see what else we're working on. Or maybe I'll pick a shorter game. I took note of everyone who submitted suggestions last time and am willing to list right now. Nice. And yourself? Uh, it's been a weird year for content. I mean, weird month for content. I went very quickly from, oh, I have no idea what to do with my channel to, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to make things for the channel. Yeah, for anybody that missed the update video, I'm with school, I'm having to just find a shorter form way of releasing content. And I think I've got something. Um, I'm trying. I'm starting a roundtable series, which is essentially just taking like a quarter of the ideas I threw out in a video before, like basically a highlight reel of them, and just presenting that. It's way mm -hmm. easier to make. And we're gonna start doing little streams that are just roundtables of us discussing, like, okay, how should we handle this idea? First one's rebooting Smash Brothers, and I'm excited to do that. Probably next weekend, maybe, possibly. I don't know. It's. I'll getting very close to midterm, so I'm not sure how, not my term's finals, so I'm not sure what my schedule's going to look like. No, good on you. I do not have the stamina to continue discussing Smash Brothers, so. It's, it's almost a second job at this point, but. <laughs> no, I would need to be paid much more. Yeah. Uh, af after that one, I'll probably just kind of, like, bounce between various things like that. I'm kind of debating between... Do I just run down a list of Smash characters? Do I try to do something else? I, I kind of want to start doing, like... Okay, people, present a Fire Emblem faction based on various corners of the world and how that works from a gameplay perspective, like units and such. Because that's All right, chat. Cool. Fix Shadow the Hedgehog. He's perfect already. How dare you? The game. Oh! He's perfect already. How dare you? Uh, but yeah, still doing Peasant's Perspective, still doing this. Uh, is there anything else I can expect? Oh yeah, more XCOM streams, because holy shit, I'm having so much fun. Like, I don't think I will, but I'm I'm not going to, but I'm so tempted just to end this stream and start doing that, because it's just been an absolute blast. <laughs> but yeah, that's it for me. You say you're not doing that, however, you can't wait to get rid of me. Hey, that's mean. To me? You can pop in if you want to. You can't say, so hey, this is me. We'll see. We'll see how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. Ah, which means we can finally get to the bonus stage. My goodness. Oh, yeah, let's go. Welcome to bonus stage. All uh, right. Okay. I, I I'm going to go first this time. Okay. Yeah, for go for it. Uh, so I haven't been doing uh, into much of any media this month. To be fair. Uh, mm -hmm. quick notes after last month's bonus stage, I have been rewatching the cartoon version of Avatar: The Last Airbender. With my brother and my dad. Uh, that show is perfect. The live action sucks. Now that I have the <laughs> reminder of the context, no, you don't get any bonus points. Wait for a me. minute. Well, how far did you get? Uh, in what? The cartoon? Uh, yeah. Uh, we just did Ember Island, so we're 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 a ways in. Oh, you're oh you're right there. Yeah, I haven't been able to keep up with all of it, but that okay. that's where they're at, and and my dad's still enjoying it. So there, there you go. Oh, good. Um, 
I also took up your recommendation. I've been watching Assassination Classroom, which has Let's go. been a, a fun second monitor until you got to what's his what what God, what's his name? Nagisa. Nagisa's mom's episode, which tore through me like a fucking spear. Wow. Yeah, when you said you ended at that episode, I was like, you you can do one more. Just, just one more, please. I swear you'll enjoy it. But no, I don't, I don't feel like I have enough to add to either conversation to really say anything more. So I'm actually going to do something a little different this time. Because when I made my update video, there was a surprising amount of interest in me to talk about this. I mean, by I mean surprise amount of interest, I mean like eight people. But for that level, that level of a sample size, that's interesting. So I'm actually going to talk about my job. Okay, cool. Yeah, so for anybody who is unaware, I work at a steelyard to survive in our capitalistic society. I am uh, equal parts a powder coater, a welder, and a sandblaster. Uh, welder is self-explanatory, of course. Uh, sandblasting is essentially power washing, like with water, but instead you have to armor up because you're shooting out highly pressurized metallic sand to scour off rust of metal. Like just so we can How do you not them? play Luke? <laughs> How? You have the experience. I... I am aware. And then powder coating is... Uh, God, how do I explain this? So, so you take the metal that you've sandblasted, you hang it on racks with hooks, and you take a gun, and you blast static electric... electrically charged powder from the gun, which will then stick to the metal, and then you take those carts of metal, push it into a walk-in oven for it to cook and bake the metal off onto. Whenever you see railings in the park and how it gets so ridiculously smooth, that's how you do that. It's it's a uh, thin coating of melted powder that is fully encased mm -hmm. the rail and completely pr protects it from the elements. So that's my job, as well as like carrying the steel from place to place to place to base. It is incredibly difficult. It is outright dangerous. I am sometimes working in the most extreme weather conditions. And it's probably the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I'm right here. I just... <laughs> the sheer arrogance. <laughs> and he's just gone. <laughs> All right. Now, that's, now, do I wait for him to come back? Or do I just keep talking? Wait, what do I do here? Have you thought about your mistakes yet? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Have you I learned that your words have consequences? I, I was just getting ready to just, like, skip over to XCOM now. I was like, oh, okay, I've just been given the opportunity. <laughs> okay, but, like... Speaking seriously for a moment, though, before I got this job, I was not not doing great. Like, this was two years ago. I was unemployed, couldn't make content because I was not motivated to do so, barely taking care of myself, so... Uh, uh -huh, same. Got the job as a uh, kind of last-ditch effort of, like, I, can't, I need to do something to support myself because I'm leeching off of other people. And those first couple of months were probably the hardest of my entire life. When you go into heavy manual labor, when your body isn't ready for it, mm -hmm. you 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 just die. You are sore 24-7, yet you constantly want to sleep. You're constantly in pain. Oh, I, I can absolutely relate. When I first went into theater, I had essentially gone from it of... Three years of not moving or talking to anyone. Oh, yeah. It was roll out of bed into chair, roll back into bed. That was day. And going into that, into choreographed dance numbers for Godspell, killed me. <laughs> murdered me. And then because we were doing a gimmick where we were like homeless people reenacting Godspell, we walked to the Goodwill, which was two and a half miles away. And I just about died. 
Oh yeah, that that's the experience right there. Like I'm, yeah, I onto all that. I'm also learning that the thing about these sorts of places where you're working in heavy manual labor is that you know that OSHA regulations should be a thing. They very rarely are. Yes. So yes, learning of shit is very much a trial by fire, oftentimes literally with an acetylene torch that will explode if you use it the wrong way. And that was just crazy for a couple of months. But then something fascinating happened. And why I want to talk about the benefits these kind of jobs have. Because mm -hmm. before this point, I was not taking care of myself. In the slightest. Not, not at all. But the funny thing about working heavy manual labor is that you kind of have to meet all of your basic needs or else you cannot exist. Yes. It is true. It's literally a gym membership you're paid for. You are going to sleep afterwards, and you're going to sleep well. You have to eat, otherwise you will die. And since they're dangerous jobs, they generally pay pretty well. So after like six months of that, I started looking around and realizing that I, I feel like a, a human again. What the fuck? I haven't felt this in years. I've been terminally yeah. online for so long, but I, I can like move. It's it's a weird side of fitness that people don't talk about. Cause it's all about like the like the visual appeal and the self esteem. But when you're just moving and like taking care of yourself, your mental problems become so much easier to deal with. To an extent, yes. To, to an extent, yes. It doesn't solve the problem, but it gives you tools that make them easier to carry. Yes, you're your body is actively producing more. So you're also, you're more focused on a specific moment. You're not lost in yourself as often. It's, it is a very healthy thing. I get my best ideas while walking and then immediately forget them upon going home because I get real tired. <laughs> exactly. Like we, we live in a world where it's very easy to get lost in, I think the term's doom scrolling, just like all the problems yes. we have right now. When you're working heavy labor, you do not have the mental capacity to do that. It's strangely meditative in that way, where you're kind of just putting all of your energy into ensuring that you have enough money to get by. And that kind of simplification is a genuinely nice mental break from the problems you're having right now. It's also mm -hmm. great for just getting different perspectives. Because, like, this was my first really heavy blue-collar job I've ever had. Mm-hmm. And it is so bizarre going into a like a steel yard setting where if anybody's worked there before these kind of settings before, there's almost a competition to be as abrasive and offensive to your coworkers as physically possible. And yet you also be in like the most diverse crowd possible where everyone's just toiling away at the same similar task. Yes, it's intentional negativity to spur camaraderie because there's the understanding that we are all in the same boat here. Yeah, and it's such a bizarre, like, having been terminally online for so long, it's such a bizarre just juxtaposition. Because, like, so many more conflicts occur, people get mad, but the conflicts become resolved directly afterwards, which is so much healthier than the kind of... Duh, how do I word this? Keeping everybody at arm's length because half of our vision of other people is in our heads. That's so prevalent online. And just, mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I haven't, I can't worded these thoughts out before, but I think it's genuinely healthy to just kind of get into those other situations just to learn what people are going through and why they think the way they, they do. I don't know, I don't know. I really just wanted to, to talk about this because I have been, uh, like, I, I make videos about video games on the internet, and I have done so for 10 years. This is probably the happiest I've ever been. And it's not because life is easy or really even happy, mm -hmm. but it's, I'm healthy. And just yeah. hitting that point 
makes everything else kind of fall into place. Kind of stepping out of that comfort zone in so many different ways and learning how to kind of coexist alongside other people. Mm -hmm. I feel like with the way the internet works, letting us choose our own bubbles, that skill is atrophying in society at large. No, absolutely. And then when that bubble bursts or becomes ruptured, it's just... It tanks your mood entirely. I have been there, where if I have a disagreement in a community, my mood is ruined. And, like, because, like, that's my moment of acceptance and if i'm not feeling accepted there then what do i have yeah but being able to have basic goals basic needs be met allows for this bridge to work very well mm -hmm. it allows for actual contentment to exist yeah uh, external validation versus internal validation yes it's just as, as soon as you get to a point where like you start getting that Everything else in life feels so much... I, I'm back in school right now. I never thought that would ha happen ever. That was a probably my single greatest failure of my past, and I turned it into success, and I think I credit the studio for giving me the tools to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to tell that story because I know that you, as someone making videos on the internet and watching lots of people on the internet, it's very easy to fall into that kind of just spiral into bubbles. Absolutely. Making that choice to make it your profession and taking away the choice not to do it, it can, it allows for such a stronger, a much stronger groundwork for your life to be constructed because you literally have to do it. I don't know if mm -hmm. I'd recommend it for everybody, but it worked for me. And if that sounds good to you, maybe it'd work for you too. No, I think that everyone, to some extent, should have some level of attempting manual labor, at the very least, or just to work things. Um, when working at the theater, I spent a summer destroying, rebuild, and rebuilding sets, as they were just short-staffed, mm. and it involved a lot of hauling tons of pounds of lumber into a U-Haul and taking it to the dump and then throwing it out in the dump and then just doing that for a day, breaking things up with hammers, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, was a miserable experience. Very cathartic, very useful, got a lot of emotions out of that. And I was closer to the people that I worked with through that experience. And it's very meaningful. Nothing to the extent that you do, I am sure. No, but I, 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 you're, you're describing the same situation. I know you can empathize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I only had to do that for a year, but you continue to perpetuate that and continue to make that a strong part of your core because it's become something there. Oh, yeah. It's, that's it's, it's, it's weird. It's gotten to the point that I don't think I ever want to leave fully. I get that. It's, an, it's a nice grounding rod. I understand. I think, I think that's very important and uh, makes anything I can bring really really petty <laughs> like damn damn how do i follow this up and be like you guys are really cool manga you want to want me to talk about it you want to talk about the life-changing spirit i couldn't i couldn't talk about tennis with you no well you guys web points of tennis I, I will admit i put absolutely no thoughts into how you be able to follow I should have gone second. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I would have been humiliated either way. This makes this much funnier because for this bonus stage, I am bringing the only thing that can come close to personal growth. He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> All right. How much exposure do you have to the Masters of the Universe series? Uh, my dad loved it as a kid. And that's it. Cool. So, my exposure to Masters of the Universe was... My friend's dad had a bunch of toys of Masters of the Universe. And I did not know what any of these characters were. And I did not know, but I loved their designs. And I... Because they were so varied and incredible. And I picked up one, 
And I looked back at him and I went, you're my absolute favorite. A man with a green skeleton face. Yeah. And I went, I've just been this person since I, I was four. One. Yes. <laughs> and I went, oh. I reflect on this memory. I go, oh, yeah. No, no, no. This is just how it's always been. Um, there was then a revival series that was on Cartoon Network in 2002. And I watched the hell out of that one. Um, I've then gone to watch bits of the original. Not too much of it. I'd say it's the one I'm least familiar with. Uh, and recently there have been multiple Netflix adaptations of Masters of the Universe. Uh, Masters of the Universe Revelation, which is a continuation. And He-Man the Masters of the Universe, which is a very much a kid's cartoon. Mm-hmm. I want to just explain why I love Masters of the Universe is entirely because I look at them and I see toys and I see stories. Masters of the Universe does not care about telling a coherent story. Instead, it goes, we had this toy. Look at this man. He has hawk wings and aviator goggles and a jetpack. Hmm. We're going to build an entire world around him. And he's rivaling with this bee man who is just a man from the bee kingdom and they're rivals and they hate each other for long set political reasons. And the hawk man is Scottish for some reason. And they all come together at this middle ground where they can go with people like the man who has a gun for an arm and can replace his gun arm with anything he wants because he invents everything. And his daughter who is just good with a bow staff. And the strongest one is just a dude who punched things real good. And sometimes he has magical powers that let him drag the moon out of orbit and bring a chain together by taking two broken pieces and going... And then it fixes itself with chain-fixing magic. As you do. And he fights an evil man who has a skunk man whose name is Stinkor. We have to come up with Stinkor lore now. And we also have Man-E Faces, who is just a man with three faces. And, oh my god, just talking about Man-E Faces... Because sometimes he's cursed that he can't control his moods and will just Jekyll and hide himself. But sometimes he's a thespian and he uses his faces to act. Because he's an underground resistance leader. And his main face is just like classically trained Shakespearean that goes into... (laughs) That's why I love Masters of the Universe. It is this mixture of... High fantasy with technology with 80s absurdism. You can tell any story that you want with these characters. And that captivates the imagination like nothing else. I don't really know. That sort of world building backwards from products is... I kind of love that, not going to lie. No, I know! Because, like, I just look at this action figure and I go, what could you possibly be? And then the TV tells me what it could possibly be. And they're like, okay, we're going to have a five-episode whole series spanning arc about the Snake Men from the Snake Dimension. (laughs) And then we're going to expand upon it on the comics as we turn your friends into Snake Men. But they get better. But King Hiss, who is spelled King H-S-S-S, because he's a snake, you see, (laughs) has the power to invoke the Snake Man inside of you all along. And he just turns into a five-headed Hydra man. Because the greatest honor for betraying your friends to make the Snake Man rise is obviously to be devoured by King Hiss. I mean, obviously. Yes. It's just neat. He-Man is voiced by Cam Clark in the 2002 show. That's perfect. I wanted Liquid Snake to be He-Man. I'm aware of that one. It's so good. Skeletor 
can have a sympathetic backstory, but he is also the defining Saturday morning cartoon villain. Yeah. There's a moment where he he first meets He-Man in the 2002 series, and He-Man overpowers him and gives him the sort of run and never return. He goes, yes, yes, of course, He-Man. And then he turns around because He-Man is helping his father, who doesn't know he's his father, because Adam has to keep that secret for reasons I don't understand, despite watching four series. He's helping his father, and he goes, Skeletor returns, and goes, oh, He-Man! I lied! And he shoots them. <laughs> and it's my favorite line, because he's so happy. <laughs> oh. uh. So the original two series, like... The original series, I don't think, is good storytelling. It is, we are doing whatever with the most limited animation we have to sell you these toys. And they make up some stupid shit for that series. Just for the sake of continuing to have a series. Mm -hmm. 2002 is like, what if we actually tried to make it a series, but we still had PSAs at the end? Because they're, like, going over the deep-seated racism between the Hawk and the Bee people. And He-Man is like, yes, they learned how to work together. You, if your friends have a disagreement, you too should learn how to work together. <laughs> I miss that age of cartoons. They're just so bad, it was, so good. This was still after it! This was 2002! I know! They were done with that! Captain Planet was a decade ago! Huh. But I do want to talk about the um, two recent series, uh, Masters of the Universe Revelation, because this one gets a lot of drama toward it, um, specifically from fans of the original, because it is a direct continuation of the original cartoon. And many people do not enjoy it. And uh, the creator of it has gone on record saying, yeah, they just don't get it. My cartoon's great. Ooh. And he's obnoxious, and I don't like that response, which is a shame, because I do generally like Masters of the Universe Revelation, because it is doing the trying to take a serious take on He-Man, but um, episode one spoilers for it as a hook, because this will get you either way. Um, He-Man and Skeletor die in the first episode. Oh. Yeah, it is a classic He-Man adventure up until the point where there's actual consequences. And then it follows Tila, who is sort of the secondary duratagonist of it. And she gets a big buff makeover, and people didn't like that. That okay. it was following a buff female character. Hey, Cora. Hello again. Yeah. Yeah. There's some of that, but there's also... You know, the promise there will be more He-Man adventures, and then that gets taken away from you oh, yeah, that's, for this. God, I, I, there's, there's so many things like that where, okay, there's some people have a point, but since the internet is binary, do you take the side that's with those ones? I exactly. Don't want to do that. Please understand that He-Man and Skeletor do not leave the story after dying. I can't. There's no way, right? Yeah, like, there's no way. Skeletor is voiced by Mark fucking Hamill in this. Oh, like, they did not yes. get him for one episode. And he is just doing Mark Hamill. He's not doing a Skeletor voice. He's just doing, oh, I don't understand. <laughs> oh, you did real good, kid. Just like, he's just doing Mark Hamill, and it's really good. Hmm. But what it does is it continues to explore He-Man's world in fascinating ways. Because it ends up as a solid time skip story. And, like, they get to explore the world that they set up in all these stupid adventures. They get to go to the lowest point of the world where they have to face all of their regrets coming manifest. And that's different for each character based on what they had. And the best thing that it does is the character of Orko. I want to talk about Orko. Orko? Okay. Orko. Orko is the scrappy-do of He-Man. 
He is the little black mage looking oh, guy with the blue bastard. hands. Okay. The, yeah, this little son of a bitch. Um, he is the comic relief. He shows up, he tries to do a thing with a funny magic spell that rhymes, and he screws up, and he has to learn a life lesson at the end. And he has a voice that's like this? And, like, you're meant to hate him. Like, this is the funny mascot character that they have to put into every single cartoon. Mm -hmm. And even the 2002 version, which is what I grew up with, I didn't like Orko. He's, he's doing the same thing. He has to learn the lessons. He has to learn not to lie and shit. And he's just useless, and he takes away from the drama. Due to He-Man dying, Orko has lost his safety net. He has lost the person that makes him feel safe and secure, and he gets horrible depression where he understands that he has not succeeded in a single thing in his life. Oh. This is the equivalent of Meowth from Pokemon getting suicidal depression. Damn, okay. Jesse and James are gone and they've been that way for years. Yes. And his friends are like there and trying, but he's been made reclusive and he's gotten sickly because he's a magical being. He has to do magic in order to continue to exist. So he's gotten weaker and weaker and this character is on his deathbed essentially. But he still goes on an adventure with his friends because that's all he has left. And because he does that, he inspires other characters through his actions. Through, despite everything, still being that little magic gremlin and still believing in himself just a little bit. Even if he's not succeeded at anything... He still has a chance to succeed. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, it's divided into two halves. A very sad thing happens to Orko in the middle. And then happier things happen later. Okay. And it's really good. On And like, this is also a series where Skeletor becomes a character named Skelegod. <laughs> okay. And he is everything that you would expect a character named Skelegod to have power-wise. But yeah, um, it just explores these characters, explores this world that anything can happen in, in such a strong and fascinating way. And that is so so good it made me care about a character that i hated before by contextualizing it and then it has writing like he man literally screaming at skeletor this isn't about us and i go oh i get it i got it but it also oh. has he man going I didn't, you know, the sword was just a conduit. I didn't need it to bring the power down. What happens when I just do it and it's only me? And you get the answer to that. And it's real good. Like, Revelations is, you don't need the backstory of uh, the He-Man franchise to appreciate it. And it's deliberately not paying off anything other than cursory knowledge of the world mm -hmm. because it's trying to tell its own story very clearly. But if you can sense what it's doing at its best, it's fascinating. And then there's the kids cartoon, which I also watched because I'm a sucker despite it being a kids cartoon. It's like one step above friendship is magic in terms of kids cartoons mm -hmm. of level of talking down to you um yuri lowenthal is he man okay and he doesn't hide it wait it is very clearly wait. yosuke hanamura no, as he man that doesn't work no it doesn't <laughs> that doesn't work at all it doesn't at all where's the no. bass you need bass for that voice not a single note of bass but it frames it because these characters are so malleable 
as sort of the fall of Skeletor and his full conversion into being that villain. And he goes from a very traditional schemer kind of villain, sort of luring things, sort of like, oh, yes, Prince Adam, of course. Very Scar Lion King. And then he transforms into the full-faced cartoon villain and nope. sacrifices everything to get there. And oh my god, the performance that is given. I think it's Ben Driskin who gave that performance. Let me check. Let me check this series really quick so I know. Yeah, 2021 He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Yep, Ben Yep, Ben Diskin as Skeletor. An incredible mugging performance. And then there are just moments of like, oh, we've locked Skeletor in another dimension with man at arms. But oh no, it's Skeletor's birthday. <laughs> he never had a birthday party before? We gotta give Skeletor a birthday party. And he, and like, it's doing the traditional cartoon thing. And then Skeletor will just kill everyone. And be like, yeah, that was fun. That does sound amazing. It's like, okay, let's not do that. And then it just goes into its deep lore and cosmic ramifications, and George Takai is Merman? And Merman is just a character who did not exist and sounds like this. face my balls. And now he's like the last Neptunian waiting for He-Man to come to him so that he can unleash the power incarnate, but He-Man is too good to do that, so instead he looks for a way to trick He-Man into just being a pure beast of destruction. And I'm like, this is the same show as Skeletor Birthday Party. This is what I mean. You can do anything. That does this sound is a, absolutely phenomenal. This is a universe with infinite possibilities, and it it makes me furious that there is not a good He-Man video game. There's not? It is th No! There's but barely it, any He-Man video games. There's like a GBA one, and that's it! But it started with product placement. I know! How? How is that... What? There's not a shitty licensed game aside from one little GBA one from like 2005 that's based on the comics that followed up the 2002 series. But like, this is the easiest property in the world to do a shitty fighting game or a Musou game with. Oh, yeah. And yet nothing. Like, He-Man is a silly series. Masters of the Universe is incredibly silly. But you can get in at any entry point, and as long as you understand that this is a stupid kids cartoon, it's so much fun. I don't think that there are more interpretations that you could give characters other than actual pantheons. Like, there is so much that you can do with these stupid characters. Make stupid worlds for them. Make infinite adventures with them. Nothing gets my brain going more than seeing He-Man characters. And of course, Skeletor is a perfect character in every single interpretation. Like, there is not a more consistent character for you are the best thing in this. No, oh, yeah. By far. Definitely know him by reputation alone. I'll admit, you got me the second you said Pantheon, and my brain said, like, what if we treated this as a kind of mythology? Wait. Yes! It's the that's the idea! You want to know why that She-Ra cartoon was so good? Because it spun off from He-Man! Oh, right! And then that created its own universe! The branches go as far as you want. The He-Man Christmas special is one of the funniest things in the world because Skeletor is just walking around with two children who want to save Christmas and he's just going, No, I am not nice. Stop. 
I'm not trying to save Christmas. Stop. <laughs> Like, if the phrase Skeletor learns the true meaning of Christmas means nothing to you, I don't think we can be friends. No, that sounds absolutely phenomenal. Also, an Atari game barely came out. <sighs> so yeah, that's, that's my pitch. This is stupid. I love it. It is the only thing that toys have ever led me correct on, of this is something that you would actually love. All right then. And like because of that, I mean, just, just look. I love figures. I love toys. I love them so much. Look at that glory. Bask in it. Praise it. And yeah, now I've screwed up my webcam setup. Yeah, I was going to say, you might want to tilt that down a little bit more. There you go. There yeah, you yeah, go. yeah, there, 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 there it is. <laughs> there it is. Too, too far that way, too far that way. There we go. All right. That's my pitch. We can move on. That's a uh, comments. Four hours and twenty minutes into this stream, we are getting to Let's the go. comments. Home stretch. Let's do this. I've also realized that I've been holding literally every stream I've done on high latency, which is really bad for audience interaction. I have fixed that, so if people have actual comments, we can respond to them a lot better now. I noticed that when people were responding in time. Uh, let's. Grab that. Nope, that's the wrong episode. Let me grab the other one. There's Naruto with a beard. There she is. From Magic Ice. What is your favorite favorite ROM hack? You know, like Project M, Randomizer ROM hacks, or the tons of amazing Pokemon ROM hacks? Oh gosh, that's, that's a good, good question. question. Yeah. There's a lot of them. Like the recent one is Emerald Rogue has been fantastic. Like, just as a concept, that's really well executed, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to say. I tend to lean more toward fan games. That tends to be my crib more. Like I grew up in the area of uh, Mario fan games, Galaxy, stuff like Toad Strikes Back. That sort of thing. Oh, uh, Sonic Robo Blast 2. Dumb. Done. Yeah, that, that, yep, that makes sense, knowing you. There's nothing that's coming yeah, close no, to that. No, no, no. Yeah, uh, Doom 2 is not nearly as good as the Sonic game that you made in it. <laughs> um, let's see. Because I tend to favor more just flat out mods, which I don't think is the same thing, really. Mm hmm. I am a big fan of just randomizers in general. I always have so much fun with I those. am fascinated by multi-game. Oh, yeah, like the Zelda Super Metroid one? Yeah, I have to check out that technology. They have uh, the uh, Archipelago thing, where they're connecting multiple games together, but they're connecting other people's playthroughs of games, so you're helping each other Yo! get Oh! Oh, oh my god, that sounds amazing. That, that that's, yeah. a, that's a modded mishap right there. I'd be totally down to do oh, that. No, no, uh... Alter did that recently. She did uh, Banjo Tooie and Pokemon Blue. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. For every Jiggy, you get a level up or Pokemon or what? Maybe sometimes you'll just get a potion, and sometimes you'll get the volcano badge, <laughs> and sometimes you'll get get Jiggy number fifty eight or something. That's amazing. Um. You know what? I, I I think the one that I've consistently had the most fun with is the Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn randomizer. Just because mm. I already love that game so much, but being able to go through it so because th there's so much depth between classes and like having three tiers of units, right? Hugely expansive story, and being able to go through it every time and just be like, oh, okay, well, what if Valtome was the main character this time? How the fuck does that work? It's horrible, for one, because he doesn't have an offensive spell until he promotes once, but... 
Oh, probably, yes. But I've had so much goofy fun. Like, I've talked about this before, that the wonderful journey of Ranulf and Volug's love story as they replace Micaiah yes. and Sol specifically. There's, there's so many different ways that game can change. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's definitely my response. Yeah, I think that's a good one. That's really good. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, comments from... Flashy Star Winger wants to play a game with us. All right. Describe something you do not like and do not think it's good, but respect anyways for being batshit insane. And see if your co-host can guess it. Wait, what? We're describing something that we think is bad, but in terms that wouldn't give it away... There's, I, and seeing I, if you can guess it. I feel like there's one more layer there. It lost me. No, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's I guess, see. You want to humor that? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of something. It, it, it's, it's got a layer of complexity that's have, giving me a hard time. It's like, now I have to think of something that you could actually guess. That's exactly, exactly. I think I could do that. Because, like... You're not going to get Danganronpa. <laughs> no, I definitely will not. Um, do you want to just twist it into a question as, okay, what's something you do not like and do not think is good but respect anyways for the batshit insanity? Yeah, sure. Because I think I can answer. I can do that a little yeah, yeah. better than that. Yeah, I think so. And now I have to think of something like that. Yeah, 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 now you have to think of something. Okay, sorry. Because I already said my easy answer. Yeah, no, yeah, d as... d different trains of thoughts. So now I have to change that train. So bad it's good. You, I mean, we've, you've constantly talked about Sonic 06. Yeah, no, 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 that's a great game. Oh my god, the Lythero that just came out on it is so I've good. I've only gotten like 30 minutes into it, but it's the That's best all thing you ever. need? It's so funny! It's so amazing. I love all of his videos, but this is just... Don't you just love it when a creator just How can one man put so many animations into one video? He's got a lot of Twitch subscribers. He can hire a lot of animators. He's really good at it. Um, fuck, this is hard. This is hard. Mostly because it's on the spot. I do not like and do not think it's good, but respect anyways for the batshit insanity. I don't like Dynasty Warriors games at all. Okay, that's fair. the concept is fun. Mm -hmm. I think that would fall into that all right, classification. Um... Oh, okay, okay I, I think I got it. Um, betrays everyone... Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. The Fox News level is really good. <laughs> Betrays everyone. You fucking agree. The Fox News level is... Oh, God. I, I feel like I know this. Oh, God. What... Fox News level that that's rain a fuck. I, you, you 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 said that to because I would know that right. In theory, hmm. you have at least played a game in this series. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it's a DMC Devil May Cry. Oh yeah, no, I would not have gotten that one. But that's that's. Like, surprisingly, gameplay, not too bad. It just is tonally one of the worst things. <laughs> There's a lot of... Oh, hey, Dylan got it before. Yeah, well he did. Dylan. He got it. Yeah. Like, is it at all a replacement? No, but now that we have DMC5, am I okay with it existing as this weird thing? Yes. Is it the worst game in the Devil May Cry series? Absolutely not. You know, on that level, I do actually kind of like Federation. Well, liked Federation Force. Like, that was a tonally deaf game to toss out there. But as a co-op experience, it's actually kind of fun. Did Tarvel pay you to say that? 
No. I bet, okay. I bet he would have, though. Probably. <laughs> uh, oh, from Carson in the chat. What art style would you like to see replicated into a video game? That's a good one. Ooh, yeah. Woodblock. What? Ooh. Like, silhouetted, burned into the wood, and see it move. I just want to oh. see that sort of animation. It doesn't have to be a full game, but for a level or for a cutscene that is somewhat interactive, I think that could be gorgeous. I definitely feel in that. I, I know Paper Mario is the first thing to come to mind, but I would love something that went just to town with origami. Mm -hmm. With the kind of just constantly shifting papers being able to be just about anything i feel like you could do well isn't so that like uh that. tearaway i'm not familiar with tearaway maybe what's tearaway yeah so the game tearaway okay <laughs> <laughs> uh that looks adorable okay yeah uh okay something else then trying to think where my oh you know what i'd really love to see a game based off of like so, so you, you've seen breath of the wild the ritos kind of symbolism and uh, fashion and stuff yeah that's based off of actual like andean culture mm -hmm. i'd love to see something like triple down on that like the super fantastical colorations with oh yeah the mythology of that area i think that could be really really good Mm -hmm. you know, that, my, my brain's just going to different areas of history and being like oh you, I, oh you know on that level like some kind of like really old school cave painting kind of aesthetic just go for a like really minimalistic almost stick figure esque I want to say I've seen that but only thing is as I, mentioned I, in chat Apotheon like which is more like Greek muses sort of thing oh you know what I um silent comedy I want something that's filled with oh, like Charlie yo. Chaplin, where the freeze frames are all slapstick, human slapstick. That that sounds amazing. With the film grain effect around it. At that point, that's conceptualizing a whole game to be necessitated by it, but I would love that. No, yeah, I'm totally down with that. 100% agreed. Uh, you know, I actually have a question, since you brought it up. Okay. How did your top 100 get updated? What left, what, what came in? Oh, yeah, um, let me actually just pull that up real quick. So. Puppets is also a 10 out of 10 idea. Potted puppets plant. is a good idea, yeah. We need more so, puppets. here is that image now. Um, what was added was games I mentioned on the podcast. Uh, Princess Maker 2 was added. Mm -hmm. uh, let's was... see what... Yeah, what else do I have on here that is new? Uh, Higurashi was taken off of the list and was put back on. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, Discovery It. Uh, recent games such as uh, Street Fighter 6 and Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth were put on. Uh, Nostalgia Opus 3 was put on adore that arcade game and uh the house in fata morgana was put on which question did any of you read that no why not i gave that like the longest sell i could <laughs> and then games that came off it were mostly games that i respect but didn't like fully love that didn't have an emotional investment in so those were tiles like am2r um, Chrono Trigger, Until Dawn, Others. It's easier to see what was added than what left. Yeah, I'm trying to look around and... Uh, Crash Bandicoot, the Insane Trilogy was taken off because it felt like a cheat and I didn't like it. To go like, yes, this specific version of Crash 1 and also it has the advantage of the other two Crash games. Yeah, like, no, free for one. If no, it, yeah, if... No individual Crash game was going to hang on, then I wouldn't want it to. Okay, nice. 
I haven't updated mine yet. I need to put Baldur's Gate 3 on their minimum, and I'll probably right. mess around right. with Oh, and I tossed Psychonauts 2 on there as well. Oh, Because nice. that was a strong experience. Yeah. Because, like, sometimes I think to myself, am I sure the Psychonauts 2? And then I remember the last world, and I'm like, yeah, Psychonauts 2. Ooh. That's a weird question, but I adore it. From 3XHS, if you could eat abstract concepts, etc. Examples, justice, confusion, self-righteousness, which do you think would taste the best and why? Um. Hmm. My gut reaction was egotism. Because that is almost always positive. In the strongest sense. And it is the richest flavor. And I love sweets. Yeah, my, my immediate gut reaction was to grab self-righteousness. Because that always feels like the best of the best. You're being healthy at the same time, too. No, there's self-doubt in that. No, I, I can't do that. Because, like, you know when you're eating a health food. You can feel it. And then you well, aren't the enjoying thing, it enough. Because self-righteousness... No, isn't always healthy, but it feels that No, way. but you know that it's, you know that you're feeling it's healthy. It has, it tastes somewhat healthy. And that, like, you taste the graininess of it. You can't, like, feast on self-righteousness. You need others there. Fair, fair. Um... Uh, I feel like you could make a great Hot Ones challenge out of eating arousal. <laughs> okay, guys, we're going to search this word on DeviantArt and eat all of the feelings that come off of it. Okay. Oh, oh God. Okay. Oh, 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 she's a big one. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, uh. Godzilla versus King Kong is <laughs> yeah. What the oh, you know what? I got it. Acceptance. I bet acceptance would taste divine. That's. I think that, that you're doing some real umami there because it would taste both bitter and sweet. Yeah, but it'd be like that kind of nice warm hug you get from like a chicken noodle soup, or like a grilled cheese and tomato. Oh, soup. chicken noodle soup is bad. Wait. What? That's just like uncultured ramen. But it, but it, but, but when you're sick and they give you the food. I just ate rice and peas. It tasted better. Ugh. All you need, rice, peas, and salt. Okay. I suppose the salt is the. Yeah. Major contributing factor. And right? butter. <laughs> Do not slander chicken noodle soup. I will. You're just asking for what ramen can give you, but doing it badly. I'm trying to argue in my head. I don't think I can, <laughs> but I'm still upset. I understand, but it, this is the feeling of playing Mario Party against me. Ugh. Can I eat that? <laughs> I just want to know what it tastes like. Because I can never know. Just that specific combination sounds great. No, that's fair. That's fair. Oh boy, we have been uh, we have been talking for four and a half hours. Do you want to call it there? Because I do. You have one more. I want to do one more. Right, I feel first, strong. First person in the chat to throw one more out. I'll give you that one. Exactly. Count it down. Ten. What's a lost media you most wish to have? That's actually a fantastic question. Actually. Oh, that's a great question. Damn, you had that, like, on cuff? Strong. Donkey Kong Racing. Probably StarCraft Ghost for me. I'm trying to come up with a different one, but that's been in the back of my head for so long. I don't think I can come up with anything better than that. Donkey Kong Racing was the first great betrayal of my life. Because it was on the back of the GameCube's box. Really? Yes. 
Donkey Kong Racing GameCube. But yep, yeah, that's it's a frequently searched title. Yeah. Also putting me in Instagram for some reason. No, yeah, oh. it's just right there. It's there? Right here. You could write on different Rambies and Zingers? It was the most beautiful game I had ever seen? Huh. That's fascinating. Isn't it? It is the most painful lie ever given to me by Santa Claus. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm sorry. That just sucks. Oh, you know, actually, no, I got a bigger one. I wish I could see what Guillermo del Toro's version of the Hobbit movie was going to be. You could just make, like, a top five out of Guillermo del Toro. <laughs> That's true. But yet, knowing how... Peter Jackson got brought in at the 11th hour and how just rushed and a disaster the production of those movies were. Oh, I would have loved to see full-on Pan's Labyrinth The Hobbit. Oh, yes. No, Del Toro is such a unique visionary of a director, which makes him impossible to work with. <laughs> yeah. But, like, he's so good at it. The Popeye movie, we, we got the boards. I've seen that bit. I wish I could have seen the animation, but as a whole, the movie probably would have run off my back. All right. So that was four and a half hours. I feel sticky. It's been, we've been talking for so long. Starting to get to that point of weather where it's going to be very uncomfortable sitting in a locked room with a computer on for a while. Fun times. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. That, that's just work, baby. Didn't that's it, life. Deed it be. Thank you all so much for joining us. If you want us to cover yep. any of your questions, just leave it in the comments with the hashtag design... Shit. What DDG is... comment. DDG comment. Thank you. <laughs> and oh, you had might... stuck swagger until the first hurdle. I, I did. I was ready. I was running up to it, and then I realized that, oh, no, I'm not going to make this one. But yeah, hope to see you all next time. We're yep. both going to be streaming, so we'll see you all very soon, should you decide very to pop by. If you made it through all of this, you have as much game as I do. Which, if you look at the start of the podcast, oh god, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, talk to you later, everybody. See yep.